of a global conversation about our shared future. So what is this TEDx? TEDx is an initiative of the TED Conference, a nonprofit devoted to ideas worth spreading. We grant free licenses to allow TED Life events to spread globally. This event today is based on the TED Conference format and ideals, but is independently organized by your local community. So please make sure to thank the team of volunteers who worked so hard on today's event. It's their ideas, dedication and time that made it all possible. It's they who booked all the speakers. And the views you'll hear today are, of course, those of those speakers, not necessarily of TEDs. But we hope their talks spark an exciting conversation among you. This is a day for curiosity and for skepticism, for openness and for critical thinking inspiration and for action. The more you enter into it, the more you'll take out. And now, on with the show. Good morning. Uh, my name is Itate Mukoro. You can work with that. Some, some people call me Tati Mukhoro. I'm curator of TEDx Johannesburg, and uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. It's a fantastic audience, and uh, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that by the time we get to the end of the day, this room will be full. Every seat will be taken. Okay, let's start with housekeeping. Um, in case of any emergencies, the exit routes are over there. The second one is directly at the back. And the third one is in that direction at the back as well. Okay. Uh, the bathrooms, you get to the lobby, the foyer, and off that, that can take you to the bathrooms. So that's pretty clear. Let's get to the business at hand then. This year, TEDx Jones, I guess we've had three TEDx events. This is the second one that we're doing. And this one happens to be a salon. A salon is just like any regular TEDx event, except that it's shorter, and the theme itself is focused on a, a much narrower topic. In, uh, for example, in this case, art. That allows us to go deeper into subject matter. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what comes out of today's session. Our last event will take place on the 24th of November at the River Sands Incubation Center, just off four weeks. So maybe we'll see some of you then. I just want to make this point about this event that helping us to curate it was Lucy McGarry, who is the curator of uh, Joburg Art Fair. And she's done a fantastic job with that. So a big hand to Lucy. I'm not sure she's here yet. We would also like to thank the role that uh, Taweni Gonde, Gondwe Klava has played in bringing this event to reality. So another big hand for the winning class. With that out of the way, it is time for TEDx Johannesburg Art for Africa. And uh, with our first speaker, we found somebody who would help us to set the foundation for today's discussion. He's a cultural analyst and one of the foremost thinkers on art in South Africa. His name, ladies and gentlemen, is Ashraf Jamal. Please, a big hand for Ashraf Jamal. Good morning, everybody. Um, being a bookish person, I have to work this way, and um, otherwise I cannot navigate 15 minutes with any degree of effectiveness. I'd like to start um, with a quotation by Ben Ockrey. It was part of his um, speech he gave at the 13th um, Moral Lecture for Steve Bantubiko. And he says, pass it on, but there are three Africans. The one that we see every day, the one that they talk about, and the real magical Africa that we don't see unfolding through the difficulties of our time like a quiet miracle. Of course, there are more than three Africans. We'll be dealing here with perspective, with how one sees, how one talks about, and this incipient idea 
that somehow on this continent, in the midst of all the gravity and all the abuse and aberration, there is beauty. It's on the basis of beauty and the human, or um, the idea of a planetary humanism, that I'm going to base this talk on art that comes in and out of Africa. For example, the FNB um, winner for this year has said that he's involved in becoming, as a future state, some bird brain of the post colonial project. Now, after 50 years of decolonization across the length and breadth of this continent, we ask ourselves, what have we truly liberated? And how are our arts effectively operating at the moment to answer the needs of the majority on this continent? Um, the Nest Collective, who are also involved in the space, bring up this idea, importantly, of collectivity, of the need for thinkers, makers, and believers um, who can explore our troubling modern identities to reimagine our past and remix our futures. Now, troubling modern, modern identities is what particularly concerns me because I see with the global growth of neo-fascism, we find its, its manifestation in this country as well. And I see it in, in, in a new kind of extremism in this, in this country, and I call it a new black nihilism, um, uh, a new right movement, a neo-fascism, that basically forces us to think of ourselves according to pigmentation, according to gender, according to class, according to economy, and destroys the one fundamental thing that joins us, which is our humanity. And if we lose that humanity in this increasingly divisive world, then basically we have destroyed ourselves utterly and thoroughly. So keep that in mind as we move on. Um, in terms of the bigger picture, um, how African is African art? How transcultural? How diasporic? Because Africa is well, now, it's a portmanteau, it's an abstraction. Um, but we insist upon it because of our knee-jerk reaction and need for essences, for quantification, for objecthood. There is no Africa, just as there is no I or you in a substantive and whole or essential sense. So there we must understand the much more fluid nature of beingness and then the constant reconstruction of the idea of Africa as something that's a verb, an adjective, an adjective being an inclination, a metaphor, an equation of the unequal. It's never something that is essential. We must just scrap the idea of essentiality fundamentally we're going to ever reach a true idea of humanity. Because essentiality is using divisiveness, for example, religious warfare, um, as one of many obvious examples of it. Now, speaking to Tati earlier on, because he, he was training me about how to do this sort of thing, which I don't normally do, um, what's your massive idea? What's your massive idea? He says, well, massive idea, whatever that is. Um, the need to free Africa of itself um, is one thing Tati suggested. To shift the stubborn notions of what we are, to remember that the continent is a big idea, a power station. Now, this is the basic premise of Lucy McGarry's curatorship of this particular event. The idea of what is an African power station, she derives it from a guy called Alexander Dorner, who, who came up with the term African power station. And this is a space, for example, for the manipulation and exercise of raw energy, production of new possibilities. Now, this can sound like jingoism or a cliche, but I'm, I don't do ad speak. Trust me, I'm trying optimistically to find a way that this raw energy can actually be actualized at this historical moment in time. So here, it is actually Simone Njami who sort of picks up on this bigger idea of what this new African moment could be. And he talks about fighting against the geographic essentialisms, the development of a new transcultural, globalized African citizenship. Transcultural, globalized African citizenship. You see, it's very inclusive. Um, and also which rejects um, the barriers between those who know and those who don't. And this is a fundamental problem we have. It's tied to classism, it's tied to, to many kinds of economic systems, which basically, and art can be a terrifyingly and disgustingly exclusionary system. So how do we find ways to actually bring that together? And thank you for not even with that. It makes me feel a lot calmer. Um, so that's something we need to fight for. And now Koya Kuyo, who is, um, Obviously, who you might, some of you might know is one of the directors of 154, which is the big African art fair based in New York and London. 154, I always wondered, because always, people always say to me, there are 54 countries in Africa, and I look at the map and I count, and I'm very bad at maps. But when I do that, I always say, but what about Fook Island? Isn't that country? <laughs> so, in other words, is a country something divide, defined by matter, or to what extent it's a country imaginary? It's both. 
And the idea of a numerical is observed. Because, of course, we go back to the 1880s and to the Berlin Conference, when the Europeans decided to carve and dice and cut up this um, continent and construct these 54 spaces, which became their economic depots and their timeshares, um, which we still live with today. How do we move beyond that idea? It's again moving beyond the idea of a nominal, the idea of a country, a nation state, which is another stupid idea. Unfortunately, that's an Enlightenment idea. And the Enlightenment tended to have some very good ones and some very bad ones. And that was one of the very bad ones. Um, so, therefore, we need to break away, break away from geographic essentialisms. We need to create a new transcultural global African identity. And as Corey Creo says, and this is very important, we also need to break away from canonization. Is that tenants way? From canonization, um, the narratives of art, and connect theoretical, visual, practical, and local knowledge. I loathe the idea of canons as I loathe the idea of power, and I was invited to the VIP event two days ago and I ran away, feeling utterly sick to the core. The very notion of a very important person is a preposterous idea. It creates other hierarchies and devastates and kills the idea of the global planetary humanity that I'm talking about. Um, but so she's also on that move to try and shift, to do that, but to deinstitutionalize, break, but please, I'm not talking here about the monoric, moronic endeavors of decolonizing our campuses. Because that is yet another product, a nihilistic product, a black essentialist, dangerous product, which is actually destroying the fundamental of education. Now you might think I'm an old fogey for saying this, but think about it. Um, there are many reasons behind I can go through fun on to explain the disastrous consequences of this, but I can't. Um, right now. But what I can talk about, I can talk about another preposterous idea which is connected to the art world, is that the new scramble for Africa. Has anybody heard that term? It's an utterly loathsome idea that you can turn, to, to bring up an aberration from the 19th century, return it and uh, apply it to the art world and say this is what we are doing. <coughs> that clearly indicates that what we are trying to do is commodify, quantify, essentialize, Africanize, the idea of African art. How African is Ed Young? <laughs> Point is, Ed, of course, Ed created Ted. Not this moronic idea of Ted, the 50 minute narcissistic enterprise. Um, no, he created a teddy bear, which you can see, a teddy bear in white jockey shorts fiddling with itself. Which is pretty much what we do. It's narcissism, it's quaninism. It's the obsessive compulsive need to watch other people. You're the voyeur, I'm the sadomasochist. <laughs> um, but so, the scramble for Africa, which is what you need to watch out for, and what we need to return to, the core thing, the idea of the human face. Now, it was um, Steve Bantubico in I Write What I Like um, who argued that what Africa will return to the world is a human face. He did not say a black face, he didn't say a white face, he didn't say a transgendered face, an albino face, he said nothing of the sort. These banalizations we live through. He said the human face. That's what Africa will give the world. Now this is a fundamental idea which I think has not really been developed, certainly not by the black consciousness movement right now. We clearly know nothing about humanity. Now the key thing, what he said was this. Africa, after 500 years of colonization, and now, as the rest of the world, and not just the Europe and America, but of course China, is turning Zimbabwe into its playpen. Um, but the point of the matter is that Africa, if Africa is going to give the world a human face, because after 500 years of conversation, there's no ways ethically, humanly, that the West can come back and repeat what it did so obscenely to this continent. So, with this new fascination with Africa, and um, Ashil Mbembe, that potentate, um, does argue that Africa is the center of the 21st century. That is a good idea amongst other very dubious ideas. But the key thing I would like to argue here is that why would Africa be at the center? It would be at the center because of a need for a new restorative humanism, a planetary humanism, a new kind of ethic. And Africa is the epicenter as a being, as a locus, as a dream for an entire Earth to actually reinvigorate, regenerate itself. And that is what I think fundamentally. So yes, while our dealerships fly in and out and art gets exported, etc., the fundamental thing remains this. 
is that we are at the epicenter of the earth right now in terms of its morality. If you think about the massive global divisiveness, the rise of neo-fascisms here and abroad, this is what we can give back. But Africa is not simply a landlocked idea. We must remember the oceans. We must remember fundamentally that we are a diasporic species. That's why the notion of a sedentary culture, a nation state, an individual are preposterous and idiotic and moronic nouns. We live in a space of perpetual flow. If we understand that, then we can embrace all of the earth and see that as part of Africa. Um, that's why a friend of mine, Jean-Marie um, Jackson, came up with the term hyperlocal. She teaches, she teaches at John Hopkins, but this particular word, I think it's really precise to actually explain our connectivity, but also our collectivity, and our, our locality. That's the key thing here. But in the midst of this fascination with globalization, the thing that does also worry me is this. Are we flatlining? Think about McDonaldization, for example. That's globalization. Is it good? It's fucking awful. Okay? So, is the art world picking up on that same kind of Esperanto, creating this new kind of language which we all speak and we all be connected to? It's like, yeah, New York, London, Paris, you know? <laughs> but are we flatlining, in other words, in the attempt to create this new Esperanto? Um, and here, um, Omar al Khatan makes the following point. He says, the globalized art market is nothing but a colonial market by proxy. So that is the dark side of the equation. And then on the positive side, we've got this Brit communist J.J. Charlesworth, who speaks about a dispersed nodal 21st century paradigm as what we cannot escape, which we actually have to engage with as central to um, how we understand the world. So yes, we have an acute sense of where we are, <coughs> right here in Johannesburg, for example. But we all have a sense that we are everywhere, that we are multiple, that we are protein. When did we ever stop doing that? Who has the audacity to look at another person and define them according to their physical disability, or their color, or their gender, and find that as their humanity? That is absolutely preposterous. But it's tied to, again, a deceleration of mind, which ridiculous phenomena like TED Talks is party to, because concentration levels, of course, have collapsed. Um, now, finally, um, I want to conclude simply by not talking about the African power station, the art world, but talking about one of my favorite pubs. Well, this is one of mine, so I'm wearing it. It's my best friend's pub in Cape Town, called Ganesh. But there's a pub in Joburg, which I love as much, called the African Freedom Station. I don't know if anybody's been there. It's in West Dean. Now, if you know it, West Dean was Triumph. And if you remember Triumph, you will remember Martin Van Nikek's amazing novel about whiteness and poverty in that particular space. And prior to Triumph, of course, it was Firetown, which has become completely mythicized as our, our hollow, as our epicenter for creativity, intellectuality, um, the arts generally, and the, the epicenter of drum. In fact, one of the sort of engine rooms of an African power station. But at the same time, of course, it wasn't just a space of creativity, it was a space that was in battle. We were always still remaining in a struggle. The key is issue here is what kind of struggle are we fighting? The struggle that I want to conclude with, which is what I began with, is the struggle on behalf of humanity. If we cannot do a struggle on that basis, we might as well just forget about it. Because identity politics, while useful, is also a terribly stupid idea. So we need to move beyond these fixities. And in the moving beyond fixities, we can then understand the importance of compassion, of an empathic revolution that can transform the way we understand each other and the way we make art. Thank you very much. for the kind words, Ashraf. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be sure to pass them on to the good people in New York. <laughs> Our next speaker is a rapidly rising star in the art world, um, not just here, actually all over the world. Um, in the past, she has been curator contemporary British art at Tate Britain and curator international art at Tate Modern. Uh, and currently she is research curator at Tate Modern. And ladies and gentlemen, Zoe Whitley is with us. Zoe? For the past 13 years, I've
I've worked with visual artists. I've also worked with the paintings, sculptures, prints, posters, and films that they've produced. I think of myself as a museum curator. What I've come to believe is that art museums can be transformative places for how we communicate, where there's a space for dialogue, and specifically where we can not only understand something about ourselves, but about our culture and the culture of others. But always, that's been mediated by artists. I want to take you guys on a little journey. So what we're going to do is we're going to pretend that I'm blindfolding you for a car journey. Um, we might need a bus, because there are a lot of us. But the point is, we're going to be blindfolded for about 45 minutes. And this is what you see when we take the blindfold off. And it's also what I saw when my parents blindfolded me when I was 13 years old. Um, I was in the car, and we lived nowhere near the beach, but I could start to smell the sea air. And I said, oh my goodness, are we going to the Getty Museum? And I know, I was kind of an odd teenager who <laughs> really wanted to go to a museum. By the time I was 12, I'd become obsessed with Pompeii and Mount Vesuvius. And while my parents couldn't afford to send me to Italy, what they could do was get free admission to the J. Paul Getty Villa, which you see here. And in the 1990s, it still housed Getty's collection of art and antiquities. Now, if I rewind us back to that bus journey, someone else who was on that bus with us, also blindfolded, was my 13-year-old best friend, who I should admit now is way cooler than I ever was or will be. And she gave the perfect teenage response. Who wants to go to a museum? <laughs> and so when we got here, I was very self-conscious about apologizing to her, making sure that she was OK, that we were in this place, even though I was having a really good time. And she said she'd never seen a museum like it. And we both had this phenomenal day um, here in these gardens, as if it were Utrescan Villa. So two black girls who never before left their home country could feel that they belonged, could have this sense of another time, another culture, another place, through the art and the objects that were there. But crucially, one of the things that artists have taught me is that it's not about the building or the gallery within the building or even the white walls within the gallery. What's most important is about creating space where art can be seen and where artists can be heard. And when I think about that sense of belonging, this is something that's recurred throughout my practice. I've had the most privileged position to be able to talk to and learn from artists. And in relation to thinking about that sense of belonging in an art museum space, I'm reminded of a quote by Durban-born artist and activist Nelly Moholy. In her film, Difficult Love, at one point she talks about her background about growing up in a place where there was no culture of going to museums and galleries, um, that there were no museums and galleries to, to go to, that culture was found elsewhere. Um, indeed, she even emphasized that museum was not part of her vocabulary. But I think artists can help us develop a new vocabulary for how we think about the experiences and dialogues around art and culture. And this is crucial because in places like South Africa, and perhaps throughout most of the African continent, where there certainly aren't the same types of art and gallery infrastructures that we have in the global north, the aim is not to replicate the syntax of a European or an American art museum. The idea is to see what works in a specific location. And it's artists who've really pushed me to do that. In conversation with the artists Lerato Shadi, I've talked a lot about what it means to belong or to feel perhaps that you don't belong in an art museum context. Um, the museum advisor and educator Elaine Gurian has talked about this notion of threshold fear. And it's a term that's taken from psychology. And what it refers to is, exactly as it seems, 
um, perhaps an aversion or a reticence to cross over certain thresholds. And it may not be that the barriers are physical. It may not be that a door is locked. It may be that you feel a certain place isn't the type of place that you go. I mentioned that I think of myself as a museum curator. Some people may think that they're not art people or museums aren't places for them. And one of the things that Murato admitted to me, and I found this incredibly poetic, she was saying that she often had to steel herself, sort of ready herself emotionally and psychologically if she were going to an art museum. And she talked about what she called a gentle violence that can sometimes happen. And this can happen in many ways. It may be in relation to um, the, the glorification of a colonial past. It could be the carelessly written museum label that ends up being offensive. It can also be being the only black body in a museum space. And I know what that gentle violence can feel like firsthand. So what's the alternative? Artists have always pushed me to think differently. They've always challenged my thinking. I've got one preconceived notion. I think this is going to work really well. It's going to be great. And then often, I'm able to think differently about how I behave or what I assume because of it. And so again, to come back to that conversation that I had with Lurato, she said, you know, what if it were possible to behave differently in museums? You know, what would be so wrong with speaking up for there to be movement, for you to not be afraid to speak in hushed tones or touch things, for there to be music and movement. And this brings me to another important museum experience in my life. Um, when I was a young child of about four or five, I had easily the experience that I credit with making me love museums. And it was at the now defunct Capitol Children's Museum in Washington, D.C. on H Street. And what I remember is that one of the exhibits looked like a Mexican town square. I'd never been to Mexico. But what was key about this was not the recreation of the edifice or the tiles or the fountain that was bubbling water. It was the fact that they taught us to sing a song aloud in Spanish. We ground corn flour and made tortillas, which we got to eat. And like these children sitting here at this table, they had a large um, volcanic mortar and pestle, and we ground chocolate so that we could make hot chocolate to drink. So if I think back to the vocalizing, the touching, the eating, and the drinking, all of those are things that are normally forbidden in art museums, aren't they? And I feel again, and it's happened particularly in contexts like the very dynamic art community here in Johannesburg, that there are all of these other ways to create space, to make room for dialogue. And an image we have here, um, I took on my camera phone, so I'll just talk you through it a little bit. It's a performance that happened at the corner of Kirk and Nugget Streets in 2014. This was on December 8th, which as many of you will know in this room, um, was the day of prayer and reflection. So referring to um, the state-issued memorialization of Nelson Mandela's death the year prior. And what we have wheat pasted is the title of the work, Digging Our Own Graves. Um, and the performance was a collective work put on by the artist and curator collective, a center for, for historical reenactments. And the person that you have crouching down in the front is an artist and healer by the name of Albert Cosa. And he's lighting candles before an altar of fruits and sweets. Um, it was very powerful to be there on that day because it became a way of, by the artist's own admission, thinking about how you might approach the rhythm of a lost or silent song. It was also a way of thinking about how we memorialize and how we remember. Um, the event was advertised um, on Facebook so a group gathered there in New Dornfontein um, that was primarily artists, curators from the Johannesburg area, me too. Um, but what was fascinating was that this performance opened up and embraced a space for what was not possible, what you couldn't necessarily account for or plan. And that was the interested passers-by, 
the sex workers, and the New Dornfontein shoppers, who stopped and gathered and also watched and witnessed this performance. And in terms of creating a sense of belonging, it was those residents and the people who were already in that area who belonged even more than those of us who came specifically to see it. Now, I mentioned the notion of threshold fear, but there's something else to think about. And this is how we each feel that we can or cannot relate to contemporary art. And I think language has such a lot to do with that. And if we were to caricature it, on the one extreme, we can dismiss it. My five-year-old could do that. And then on the other extreme, perhaps we've got the parody of, oh, it was fabulous, darling. It's the best thing I'd ever seen. This effusive praise for things that no one can quite get their head around. Um, but somewhere in between, like with everything else, there's the truth. And there's a fascinating moment that occurred, again, in my own life, when I took my five-year-old daughter to see the work of Kemang Walehuleri when he had his first exhibition in the United Kingdom last year. And she is five years old. She said five, she said four words to him, actually. I like those dogs. And I know it's easier to say, okay, well, it's a five-year-old, so you can say something honest and simple and people will appreciate you and pat you on the head. But she did something else. This is a detail of one of the works. And she asked a question I didn't think to ask. She asked the artist, where's the dog's body? And he took her deeper into the exhibition and showed her that the dog's body was part of another work. I wouldn't have known that. Maybe if you stood there, I could talk you a little bit through Kamang's biography, about his larger body of work, some of the themes that he was working with. But there's no way I could have answered that basic question. So. I just want to leave you with the idea that sometimes, maybe your five-year-old could do that. And that's okay. That's enough as a starting point for you to feel that art and artists are welcoming and that we can all learn and speak this language together. Thank you. great city of the continent is now beginning to produce the same in art. Jim Chuchu, our next speaker, is one of the leaders of that exciting new development. Ladies and gentlemen, Jim Chuchu. It's working. I was And 
yes, there were consequences to being those guys who made this film. Uh, the film was banned in our country, and one of us got arrested. And institutionally and individually, there were consequences. I have friends who uh, didn't really talk to me after that, and I haven't really known why. Those are some of the things we get that are the costs of these things. And so, we remain in Nairobi, Kenya, as a collective and as myself, as uh, We remain in Kenya, we remain in Nairobi. And every time I travel to uh, other countries and fairs like these, invariably I hear the question, so where are you based? <coughs> and the answer is always Nairobi. And sometimes I get the sense that people asking me that question are <coughs> disappointed with the answer. Like maybe I'm not taking my art career seriously because I'm staying in Nairobi, which is a cultural wasteland by, by global standards. Uh, but this question has remained with me, and I've started to look around at all the artists around me, all the filmmakers and the writers, and it's so often that you find that people are born in Ghana, but they live in Paris, live and work in Paris, live and work in New York, live and work in Brussels. Um, and I'm really curious about that. Um, Living and working in Nairobi isn't exactly the best thing for an artist. Um, sometimes you have crazy things like power cuts, which means that you go to the studio and kind of fiddle your sounds all day, waiting for power to come back. Uh, you have to import everything, like paper, cameras, uh, small things, paint. You can find them in the shop, you have to import them. The taxes are smarter. Uh, <laughs> and and we miss out on the global conversation around art. It's not often that we get to be in a place like this where we see other African art. And the past few days of the fair, I've been, I'm here with three members of the collective, and it's been amazing. It's hard to explain how, how our brains literally shift when we see this work. Uh, it enters our spirit, and that's something that is denied to us by <coughs> living and working in our room. Um, and we miss out on all these things like residences and all opportunities that happen. Um, and it is odd for us that even now, it's very hard to find African art in Africa. It's much easier to come across an African film in a festival in Europe or in New York, and that's strange. So there are definitely disadvantages, but we continue to choose to stay in Nairobi because every time we make work in Nairobi, the, the city shifts, uh, the country shifts kids are watching what we do and they expand their imagination of what it is to be Kenyan and to be black and to be African. And people find a voice in the work and they hear a word or a feeling they've had but not had the exact word to say what it was. Our current project is a web series called Tukomacho, which has explored how justice works in our city, in our country. And doing it has allowed there to be a conversation about how unfair it sometimes is to be in Kenya and to have different laws applied to you depending on how, how much money you have. Um, it also <coughs> shifted the conversation about how the role of means for TV versus the internet. Um, and so we continue to stay so we feel like ultimately that work is more rewarding uh, than the residencies and the, and the awards and the, and the fairs. Um, and so, back to the question of, of why do we stay? I feel like too many of the best African minds, the best <coughs> African filmmakers, the best African writers, the best African visual artists, too many of our friends and our colleagues in the art world are living in Paris and Brussels, all these cultural capitals of the world. Uh, in residency, the turning to self-exile, the turning to citizenships. Uh, that means that we don't see you again, that we don't see you work. And we feel like it's important for these minds to come back home, uh, to show you work in the continent, because you have no idea how much, how important it is for us to see ourselves in film and in books and in music. You have no idea how important it is for the kids to see themselves and to imagine that they are more than, than what they are told they are. We have a rampant 
predatory Christianity that's sweeping across our country, for instance, that asks children to, to focus more on the world that is to come, to give their earnings to pastors who are spending their money in this world. <laughs> and it is the artist's work to push back against these things. It's not going to be the politicians who push back against this. It is the artists who have the tools to expand the idea of existing outside of Christianity. And so, I think, to summarize my thoughts, I really hope that with time, the greatest minds in our art world will come back home and show us their work and expand what it means to be Kenyan. I really like this idea of Africa as the epicenter of a new dreaming, as probably a supplier of the answer to where humanity will go in the next few years and centuries. And so we really want the great minds of Africa to be part of that. in our program that Mante Ribane would take the stage at this point. Um, unfortunately, due to circumstances beyond our control and probably hers too, uh, she's unable to join us today. But we do have a treat in place of that, and it's a TED Talk uh, that I hope will challenge your or all of our understanding of what an artist is. Blaise Aguera Iacas. I tried, right? Blaise Aguera Iacas. Can you help me out, Kong?
good? Okay, yeah. thank you. Apologies for that, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Grace Aguera Yarkas. So, I lead a team at Google that works on machine intelligence. In other words, the engineering discipline of making computers and devices able to do some of the things that brains do. And this makes us interested in real brains, neuroscience as well, and especially interested in the things that our brains do that are still far superior to the performance of computers. Historically, one of those areas has been perception the process by which things out there in the world, uh, sounds and images, can turn into concepts in the mind. This is essential for our own brains, and it's also pretty useful on a computer. The machine perception algorithms, for example, that our team makes are what enable your pictures on Google Photos to become searchable based on what's in them. The flip side of perception is creativity turning a concept into something out there into the world. So over the past year, our work on machine perception has also unexpectedly connected with the world of machine creativity and machine art. I think that Michelangelo had a penetrating insight into this dual relationship between perception and creativity. This is a, a famous quote of his, every block of stone has a statue inside of it, and the job of the sculptor is to discover it. So I think that what Michelangelo was getting at is that we create by perceiving, and that perception itself is an act of imagination and is the stuff of creativity. The organ that does all the thinking and perceiving and imagining, of course, is the brain. And I'd like to begin with a brief bit of history about what we know about brains. Because unlike, say, the heart or the intestines, you really can't say very much about a brain by just looking at it, at least with the naked eye. The early anatomists who looked at brains gave the superficial structures of this thing all kinds of fanciful names, like hippocampus, meaning little shrimp. Uh, but of course, that sort of thing doesn't tell us very much about what's actually going on inside. The first person who I think really developed some kind of insight into what was going on in the brain was the great Spanish neuroanatomist Santiago Ramón y Cajal in the 19th century, who used microscopy and special stains that could selectively fill in or render in very high contrast the individual cells in the brain uh, in order to start to understand their morphologies. And these are the kinds of drawings that he made of neurons in the 19th century. This is from, uh, from a bird brain. And you see this incredible variety of different sorts of cells. Even the cellular theory itself was quite new at this point. And these structures, these cells that have these arborizations, these branches that can go very, very long distances, this was very novel at the time. They're reminiscent, of course, of wires. Uh, that might have been obvious to some people in the 19th century. The revolutions of wiring and electricity were just getting underway. But in many ways, these microanatomical drawings of Ramon y Cajal's, like this one, uh, they're still in some ways unsurpassed. We are still, more than a century later, trying to finish the job that Ramon y Cajal started. These are raw data from our collaborators at the Max Planck Institute of Neuroscience. And what our collaborators have done is to image um, little pieces of brain tissue. Uh, the, the entire sample here is about one cubic millimeter in size, and I'm showing you a very, very small piece of it here. That bar on the left is about one micron. The structures that you see are mitochondria that are the size of bacteria. And these are consecutive slices through this, uh, through this very, very tiny block of tissue. Uh, just for comparison's sake, the diameter of, uh, of an average strand of hair is about 100 microns. So we're looking at something much, much smaller than a single strand of hair. And from these kinds of serial electron microscopy slices, one can start to make reconstructions in 3D of neurons that look like these. Uh, so these are sort of in the same style as Ramon y Cajal, only a few neurons lit up because otherwise we, we wouldn't be able to see anything here. It's so it would be so crowded, so full of, of structure, of wiring or connecting one neuron to another. So Ramon y Cajal was a little bit ahead of his time. And progress on understanding the brain proceeded slowly over the next few decades. 
But we knew that neurons used electricity, and by World War II, our technology was advanced enough to start doing real electrical experiments on live neurons to better understand how they worked. And this was the very same time when computers were being invented, very much based on the idea of modeling the brain of intelligent machinery, as Alan Turing called it, one of the fathers of computer science. Warren McCulloch and Walter Pitts looked at Ramon y Cajal's drawing of visual cortex, which I'm showing here. Uh, and this is the cortex that processes imagery that comes from the eye. And for them, this looked like a circuit diagram. So uh, there are a lot of details in, in McCulloch and Pitts' circuit diagram that are not quite right. But this basic idea that, that visual cortex works like a series of computational elements that pass information one to the next in a cascade is essentially correct. So uh, let's talk for a moment about what a model for processing visual information would need to do. The basic task of perception is to take an image like this one and say, that's a bird, all right? Which is a very simple thing for us to do with our brains, but you should all understand that, that for a computer, this was pretty much impossible just a few years ago. The, the classical computing paradigm is not one in which this task is, is easy to do. So what's, what's going on between the pixels, between the image of the bird and the word bird, is essentially a, a set of neurons connected to each other in a neural network, as I'm diagramming here. And this neural network could be biological inside our visual cortices. Or nowadays, we start to have the capability to model such neural networks on the computer. And I'll show you what that actually looks like. So the pixels, you can think about as a first layer of neurons. And that's, in fact, how it works in the eye. That's the, the neurons in the retina. And those feed forward into one layer after another layer after another layer of neurons, all connected by synapses of different ways. The behavior of this network is characterized by the strengths of all of those synapses. Those characterize the computational properties of this network. And at the end of the day, you have a neuron or a small group of neurons that light up saying bird. Now, uh, I'm going to represent those three things, the input pixels and the synapses in the neural network and bird the output uh, by three variables, x, w, and y. There are maybe a million or so x's, a million pixels in that image. There are billions or trillions of w's, which represent the weights of all these synapses in the neural network. And there's a very small number of y's, of outputs, that that network has. Bird is only four letters, right? So let's pretend that this is just a, a, a simple formula, x times w equals y. I'm putting the times in scare quotes because uh, what's really going on there, of course, is a very complicated series of mathematical operations. That's one equation. There are three variables. And we all know that if you have one equation, you can solve for one variable by knowing the other two things. So um, the problem of inference that is figuring out that the picture of the bird is a bird is this one. It's where y is the unknown and w and x are known. You know the neural network, you know the pixels, and as you can see that's actually a relatively straightforward problem. You multiply two times three and you're done. I'll show you uh, an artificial neural network that, that we've built recently doing exactly that. So this is running in real time on a mobile phone and uh, that's of course amazing in its own right, that, that mobile phones can do so many billions and trillions of operations per, uh, per second. So what you're looking at is, is a phone looking at one after another picture of a bird, and actually not only saying, yes, it's a bird, but identifying the species of bird with, with a network of this sort. So in that picture, the x and the w are known, and the y is the unknown. I'm glossing over the very difficult part, of course, which is how on earth do we figure out the w? the brain that, that can do such a thing? How would we ever learn such a model? So this process of learning, of solving for w, if we were doing this with the, with the simple equation in which we think about these as numbers, we know exactly how to do that. 6 equals 2 times w, well, we divide by 2, and we're done. The problem is with this operator. right? So division, we've used division because it's the inverse to multiplication, but as I've, as I've just said, the multiplication is a bit of a lie here. Right? This is a very, very complicated, very nonlinear operation. It has no inverse. So we have to figure out a way to solve the equation without a division operator. And the way to do that is fairly straightforward. You just say, well, let's, let's play a little algebra trick and move the 6 over to the right-hand side of the equation. 
Now we're still using multiplication. And that zero, let's think about it as an error. In other words, if we've solved for w the right way, then the error will be zero. And if we haven't gotten it quite right, the error will be greater than zero. So now we can just take guesses to minimize the error. And that's the sort of thing that computers are very good at. Right, so we take an initial guess, what if w is zero? Well, then the error is six. What if w is one? The error is four. And then the computer can sort of play Marco Polo and drive down the error close to zero. And as it does that, it's getting successive approximations to w. And typically, it never quite gets there. All right? But after about a dozen steps, we're up to w equals 2.999, which is close enough. And this is the learning process. So uh, remember that what's, what's been going on here is that we've been taking a lot of known x's and known y's and solving for the w in the middle through an iterative process. And it's exactly the same way that we do our own learning. We have many, many images as babies, and we get told this is a bird, this is not a bird. And over time, through iteration, we solve for w, we solve for those neural connections. So now we've held x and w fixed to solve for y. That's everyday fast perception. We figured out how we can solve for w. That's learning, which is a lot harder because we need to do error minimization using a lot of training examples. And about a year ago, Alex Morvinsev and our team, he decided to experiment with what happens if we try solving for x, given a known w and a known y. In other words, you know that it's a bird, and you already have your neural network that you've trained on, on birds, but what is the picture of a bird? So it turns out that by using exactly the same error minimization procedure, one can do that with the network trained to recognize birds, and the result turns out to be a picture of birds. So this is a, a picture of birds uh, generated entirely by a neural network that was trained to recognize birds, just by solving for x rather than solving for y, and doing that iteratively. Uh, here's another fun example. This, this was a work made by Mike Taika in our, our group, which uh, he calls Animal Parade and reminds me a little bit of William Kentridge's artworks in which he makes sketches, rubs them out, makes sketches, rubs them out, and creates a movie this way. And in this case, what, what Mike is doing is varying Y over the space of different animals in a network designed to recognize and distinguish different animals from each other. And you get this kind of strange Escher-like morph from one animal to another. Here, he's tried reducing, he and Alex together have tried reducing uh, the, the y's to a space of only two dimensions and thereby making a map out of the space of all things recognized by this network and then doing this kind of synthesis or generation of imagery over that entire surface, varying y over the surface so that you make a kind of map, a visual map of all of the things the network knows how to recognize. The animals are all here, armadillo is right in that spot. You can do this with other kinds of networks as well. So this is um, a network designed to recognize faces, to distinguish one face from another. And here, we are putting in a y that says me, my own face parameters. And when this thing solves for x, it generates this rather crazy kind of cubist, surreal, psychedelic picture of me from multiple points of view at once. And the reason it looks like multiple points of view at once is because uh, that network is designed to get rid of the ambiguity of a face being in one pose or another pose being looked at from one, with one kind of lighting, another kind of lighting. So when you do this sort of reconstruction, if you don't use some sort of guide image or guide statistics, then you'll get a sort of confusion of different points of view because it's ambiguous. This is what happens if Alex uses his own face as a guide image during that optimization process to reconstruct my own face. So you can see it's not, it's not perfect. There's still quite a lot of work to do on how we optimize that optimization process but you start to get something more like a coherent face rendered using my own face as a guide. You don't have to start with um, a blank canvas or with white noise. When you're solving for x, you can be begin with an x that is itself already some other image. Uh, that's, what, that's what this little uh, demonstration is. This is a network uh, that, uh, that is designed to categorize all sorts of different objects, man-made structures, animals. And here we're starting with just a picture of clouds. And as we optimize, Basically, this network is figuring out what it sees in the clouds. And the more time you spend looking at this, the more things you also will see in the clouds. You can also uh, use the face network to hallucinate into this, and you get some pretty crazy stuff. <laughs> or um, 
Mike has done some other experiments in which he takes that cloud image, hallucinates, zooms, hallucinates, zooms, hallucinates, zooms, and in this way, you can get a sort of uh, fugue state of the network, I suppose, or a, a sort of um, um, free association in which the network is eating its own tail. So every, every image is now the basis for what do I think I see next? What do I think I see next? What do I think I see next? Um, I, I showed this for the first time uh, in public to, um, to a, a group uh, at a lecture in Seattle called uh, Higher Education. This was right after marijuana was legalized. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like, to, I'd like to finish up quickly by just noting that this technology is not constrained. I've shown you purely visual examples because they're really fun to look at. Uh, it's not a purely visual technology. Um, our artist collaborator, Ross Goodwin, has done experiments involving a, a camera that takes a picture and then a computer in his backpack that writes a poem using neural networks based on the contents of the image. And that poetry neural network has been trained on a, a large corpus of 20th century poetry. And, and the poetry is, you know, I think kind of not bad, actually. <laughs> in closing, I think that per Michelangelo, I think he was right, perception and creativity are very intimately connected. Uh, what we've just seen are neural networks that are entirely trained to discriminate or to recognize different things in the world, uh, able to be run in reverse to generate. And one of the things that suggests to me is not only that Michelangelo really did see the, the sculpture in the blocks of stone, but that any, any creature, any being, any alien that is able to do perceptual acts of that sort is also able to create because it's exactly the same machinery that's used in both cases. Also, I think that perception and creativity are by no means uniquely human. Uh, we start to have computer models that can do exactly these sorts of things, and that ought to be unsurprising. The brain is computational. And finally, computing began as an exercise in designing intelligent machinery. It was very much modeled after the idea of how could we make machines intelligent. And, and we finally are starting to fulfill now some of, the, some of the promises of those early pioneers of Turing and von Neumann and, and um, McCulloch and Pitts. And I think that computing is not just about accounting or playing Candy Crush or, or something. From the beginning, we model them after our minds. And they give us both the ability to understand our own minds better and to extend them. Thank you very much. Only one person believes that. Yeah. So I, I tell you, the rest of us believe that yeah. humans are not going to be able to do it. Yeah. Gustav, are we ready for the next time? Yeah. Sure. Look at our next time. Wonderful. Uh, SMS. Sure. Our next speaker is co founder of the company that is responsible for building uh, the leading art fair on the African continent. Her name is Kobi Labos Please welcome her to the stage. Kobi. Frustrations and surprises, that's what comes to mind when I think about my journey with the visual arts. Frustrations with the language of art, surprises about what I really value within that, frustrations with how you then communicate that, and then surprises about what's possible with the right forum. I'm going to start by speaking broadly about my moments of interface with the power of art through my role as director at the FMB Journal Art Fair. And I'm then going to zoom right in to leave you with an example of one artwork that I think the emancipatory potential of art to change our futures on the African continent. When I was at art school, I didn't fit in. I come from a family of scientists, and the move to study art was born out of a frustration with science. But then when I arrived at art school, I became frustrated with what I experienced as 
the limited impact that art was having on a broad world. The language of art also didn't resonate with me. Many of my peers had an implicit understanding of what the debates were really about, but for me it was foreign. I had the sense that the conversation was bouncing around the room like a squash ball in a closed court. And I thought, if only this could be amplified, if only the volume could increase radically so that art can be seen as a professional practice that has a meaningful place in the everyday life. And then if the scale is such that a transparency is reached, how do we use this vehicle to communicate different identities, difference, different possibilities for the future, and dreams for the present? Because I have no doubt that art is one of the most powerful and appropriate channels for communicating this very important message. When you want to create a momentum of sorts, you have to start with what's possible. I'm well aware that an art, art fair is not the only or most ideal setting within which to engage with art. It can't be compared to museums or biennales where the experience can be truly expected. But what was possible at the time was a forum centered around the buying of art. And I've come to understand that buying art is one of the easiest ways to start a love affair with what art is really about. For example, one year we ran a competition online where you could win some money towards buying an artwork at the art fair. The woman who won was in Mossel Bay, thousand art kilometers from Johannesburg, so she couldn't make it. She sent her newly married daughter and husband to the fair. I met them at the door and they were like, are there any pictures of flowers? <laughs> An animal, perhaps? But they ended up hours later buying a provocative print from Artist Proof Studio that somehow resonated with the decisions that they had taken in their lives. <coughs> Another example of bridging the gap. Every year we run an Arts Talks program within the fair. And one year we took the decision to run it only on the Saturday. And suddenly my inbox was flat with complaints from attorneys and bankers and IT specialists and academics interior decorators, who were upset that this year, because they happened to have something on, on that Saturday, they won't be able to interact with this forum for learning that they have been interacting with in other years and looking forward to. And I thought to myself, surprising, who is waiting out there to interact with art when it is made accessible? I can't really speak about my pro project of access without speaking about this place, Johannesburg. My practice is critically based in this city on the African continent. Johannesburg for me embodies everything that I've been speaking about, about having a wider conversation where more people are involved. Johannesburg is a place of bold business, famously, historically. It can be ruthless, so it has its problems, but it's also a place of possibilities, of bravery, of let's do it. And that's the kind of attitude you need when you want to affect change. I'm now going to zoom into one artwork by an artist that practices here in Johannesburg. But before I do so, some context. Because the art fair is a vast aggregate of content, a kind of mental algorithm can be run. I like to call it a barometer of the present moment, what's really going on. And unlike other channels of communication, such as news or media, this is the present that has been interpreted, expressed, digested. So if you had crossed the divide between the world and the art world that I've been speaking about, you might have noticed, as I have, a new politics of self being expressed, especially in the work of young black South African photographers, especially within the medium of photography. One of our giants of photography, David Goldblatt, commented that after the fall of apartheid, some South African photographers had lost their context, had lost their subject. There was no longer a known enemy. He was speaking specifically about the mode of documentary photography that had found its place into the gallery space. Documentary photography is about documenting the outside. What is happening out there? The move that I have seen, that I am interested in, is a reversal of that. When the camera is facing the self, and the narrative is, the subject is the self. That is the narrative that's being created. This is a subject that's actively creating an everyday <coughs> in the African continent. <coughs> and a narrative that is owned. I use the term every day here in the political sense of a struggle for freedom. I can name a few artists for you today. Mandipa Mutambo, Mary Sabande, Mohamed Issa King, Zanele Mohole. Artists that use their own body, often through the medium of performance, often through their close community. To communicate a happening 
that they have enabled, that they have directed and scripted and owned. These are innovative voices that actively express contemporary reality on the African continent. I use these artists as symbols, as synecdoche for a larger phenomenon, a larger movement that is gathering momentum on the African continent about African contemporary expression and culture. Contemporary photography has done a lot of work to dislodge what international curator Opry and Weze has called the incredibly grim view of Africans that resides within the Western paradigm. The artists that I have mentioned also work against that view, but not always actively, sometimes silently, through the medium of playfulness, imagination, and intimacy. A while ago, I bought an artwork by Zanele Moholi, which hangs in a central place in my house. It's called Isililo 20, which means to cry. We engage with this uncompromising artwork in our house on a daily basis, conversing about it with our small children and guests who come and go. It has taken a life of its own within our life. This artwork for me marks a shift in her practice from photographing her, the members of her community, the gay and lesbian community, for reasons of activism often, to turn the lens on herself, where she comes to exemplify everything that she has been speaking of in her career, staring back at the camera. And this journey of expression that she has walked in her work exemplifies for me the journey that we have to walk in South Africa and on the African continent, not only for ourselves to understand our lives better, but also to turn that into an activism for the rest of the world who is watching, where we are creating our narratives and staring back at the camera with unblinking eyes. <laughs> Even if, given where we come from, given what we have been through, and given what we are, even today, shockingly, so struggle with, even if sometimes those eyes are filled with tears. Thank you. Thank you, Kobe. So for the next uh, item on the program, we, we have a conversation. It's a conversation between Aida Malone, whose work is currently exhibited all over Johannesburg, as you would have seen. She is the featured artist of the FNB Joburg Art Fair um, for this year. She is in conversation with um, writer and academic Nileka Jaiwardani. And she's from the US, originally born in Sri Lanka, currently working in New York. Please welcome Aida and Nilika. interviewing artist Aida Mourine for an article published recently in Transition magazine titled Between Nostalgia and Future Longing. Aida Mourine was born in Ethiopia but spent her life in many countries including Yemen, England, Cyprus, Canada and the United States. She has a degree from the Department of Media journalism and film at Howard University, a historically black university located in Washington, DC. In 2007, she went to Addis Ababa on a three month journalistic assignment as a photographer. Nine years later, she is still there, having founded a social enterprise, Desta for Africa or DFA, which provides training for photographers photography services for both corporate and institutional needs, and plans events that focus on cultural diplomacy. Part of that enterprise is Addis PhotoFest, 
a biannual photography festival that has become one of Africa's go-to art biennials. In the biannual, um, in the past five years, Moulinet's artwork has been shown widely. It was included in the Smithsonian Museum's epic exhibition, The Divine Comedy, Heaven, Purgatory, and Hell Revisited, by contemporary African artists, curated by Simone Njami. Works in her 99 series were also part of Towards Intersections, negotiating subjects, objects, and context, an ambitious exhibition curated by South African Tembikosi Goniwe at UNISA Art Gallery in Pretoria, South Africa last year. Earlier this year, as New York's Armory Show spotlighted artists from Africa, Mulade's first solo exhibition, The World is Nine, was showing at David Crute Gallery. So, Aida, perhaps we should begin by asking you about your origin story as a photographer, which is really as a documentary photographer. What led you to pick up a camera and imagine it as a way of seeing the world, or perhaps I should say re-seeing the world, and subsequently challenging the ways in which we see worlds such as Ethiopia and Africa as a whole. Well, hello everybody. I'm gonna try to do this in 18 minutes. <laughs> Um, so I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I just wanted to start off, uh, most people don't know about my journalistic background because most of you have seen you know, these very colorful white painted faces. So initially when I started photography, um, I was in high school in Canada and uh, we had a really great art department and we had a dark room that nobody was using. So a group of five students, we decided to basically convince our art teacher to teach us how to use the dark room. And uh, from that moment for me, when I saw my first print, which I still remember it, uh, you know, I, most photographers, when we start out, you know, we take photos of photographs, I mean, flowers and trees and so forth. So it was actually a, a flower. And when I saw that developing in the dark room, that's when basically my obsession with photography started. Um, however, living in Canada, uh, often, you know, uh, I grew up in, uh, you know, during the famine period in Canada, when we were hearing all this news about the famine in Ethiopia, of the 80s, but the way I grew up in my home was, you know, the stories that my mother told me was something that was quite the opposite of what I was seeing in the international media. So from that, also living in North America, often when we look at the black community, there's always this misrepresentation that you see going out in the various news outlets and so forth. So from then on, um, basically I made it uh, my life mission to really offer a balanced perspective when we talk about you know, our realities, whether as an Ethiopian, as an African, or as the diaspora. So uh, picking up the camera was something that, uh, for me, wasn't just an artistic choice, but it was really an advocacy for my own community. So when I first went to Ethiopia in, uh, in 2000, I spent uh, almost the same amount of time, about three months, and it was really trying to uh, create a photo album of a time period that I wasn't there. So having grown up abroad, you know, most of my family albums was not really of a place that I've always referred to as home. So through these images, uh, you know, I focus mostly on black and white. Uh, I'm a big fan of black and white because I, I feel that, you know, uh, when we look at photography or architecture and so forth, it's really about how light enters, how light reflects and what have you. But I wasn't really interested in, you know, uh, the touristical aspects of Ethiopia, I was interested in the daily life. So most of the time I say, you know, I don't take photographs of animals or nature, you know, I'm primarily interested in how people live their lives, you know, how my community interacts within specific spaces, and on top of that as well, um, how I can preserve, you know, as a witness of that time period, you know, for the future generation. And in this sense, it's also a way of showing the world, you know, this balanced perspective that it's not always about the famine or the chaos or, you know, strife and what have you, that I often find not only for Ethiopia, for across the continent, that we have this distorted uh, images that go out that doesn't offer the full uh, perspective. And this is also something that I think uh, we have to be more engaged in as far as when we talk about, you know, artists from Africa or photographers from Africa. And in this way, it's really, you know, how do I advocate, how do I show the world something that, you know, uh, other people have not experienced or have seen. and. This is again not to say that everything is peachy or everything is perfect, but it's to say that just as you have the sadness, you also have the joy. So 
So from that, uh, my journalistic work, I still do it. Uh, I still do work also for the Washington Post, and I do work as a commercial photographer. I'm not uh, sort of a snobby photographer or artist or an elitist when it comes to that. I believe photography is photography. And within that, I exist in different realms uh, within image uh, production. So the key point being is how do I share with the world you know, something that I feel passionate about, which is my people. Of course, what you are now known around the world and all over Johannesburg um, is for your fine artwork. Your first solo exhibit, The World is Nine, includes striking images based on photographs taken at Lekhar train station in Addis Ababa, one of the oldest train stations in Africa. Will you speak about the historic and symbolic significance of this train station and why you chose it as a backdrop? What's the role of nostalgia in your work? So, um, as an Ethiopian, nostalgia is, I don't know, a big part of our culture. You know, we're always looking to the past. And, you know, Lagahar was a train station that was built at the turn of the century. Uh, it was a relation between the Ethiopian and French government. And the train line basically went from Addis Ababa to Djibouti, uh, which is the port. Um, you know, in a lot of my research, what I look at is, uh, you know, I go through many archive images, and through those archives, you know, I've seen a lot of images from the 30s and 40s, and you know, there's so much elegance and so much dignity, and within that elegance and dignity, there was also you know, so much of our culture, which is uh, not necessarily a Western interpretation, but our own. So my inspiration, whether it's the clothing, whether it's the location, it's really looking at, even for myself, I am in transit, so you know, having grown up in so many places, it really goes back to also, you know, uh, not only my personal history, but the history of the country and how you know, we've gone through so many uh, challenges, but at the same time also there has been victories within that. And through this interpretation, what I'm looking at is how do I bring elements of the past into the future, but within that also, how can I have my conversation of you know, the things that I've experienced, uh, not only abroad, but also uh, within the country. Mm -hmm. So within some of these images are pieces that speak to your conversation consistently conversing with those ideas of being in transition, um, having nostalgia, but also about love, romance, and the divides that we create between us um, as we move into worlds um, that separate love sometimes. And in particular, I was struck by Conversation, which is a piece that was inspired by a British Ethiopian poet, Lem Sisse's poem, um, The Elephant in the Room. In that poem, it re refers to a, the proverbial elephant that enters a life shared by a couple. He reflects on the ways in which an unacknowledged lie can quietly and sometimes very noisily demolish love. Will you speak a little bit about conversation and how you wove that poem into the visual work? Um, so this image, um, you know, a lot of my work is also dealing with uh, poetry. So, you know, I'm inspired by different things. And Lem Sisai, uh, who lives in London, uh, is a very fascinating, you know, has a very fascinating history, an Ethiopian as well. And just like me, he lived abroad. And, um, you know, when I do my work, it's not, I, I don't try to over-philosophize it, you know, I, I just do my work because I enjoy doing it. So, you know, uh, some, you know, just, in a lot of interviews, you know, they talk about conceptual art. I wasn't creating this work to talk about conceptual art. I was just wanting to express what I was feeling inside. Mm -hmm. So most of my work is really dealing with just, uh, you know, as I've said again, it's you know, it's a visual diary, and within that visual diary is finding inspirations also of other things that <laughs> I've come across. So when we talk about conversation, you know, uh, the culture that I come from, you know, we don't necessarily express what we feel. You know, we have this expression that we keep everything in our stomach. So in that sense, when you look at relationships as well, you know, it, it is one of those things where I feel that, you know, communication is a key component. So not only in our personal lives, but as a society, as a community, and to overcome specific challenges for me, it's also how do we have a dialogue uh, that sort of addresses that elephant in the room. So in Ethiopia, there are many challenges and there's many things that we have to deal with, but this cannot happen uh, without the conversations. So. It's within a personal note, but also as a nation, these are the things that I've seen from me. Mm. So all of you have seen those um, very striking billboards um, of um, Ida's work all over Johannesburg by now. And I'm sure you've been thinking about why um, she uses 
these beautifully costumed women um, and the painted faces and painted bodies and painted hands. So I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about um, what's the inspiration behind some of that. So um, the starting point for me uh, was actually this. So this was a seven part piece from Simone's Jam exhibition, which was basically the African interpretation of the divine comedies. So my section was the Inferno, and within that, um, because people have just gotten used to me doing black and white, I decided, well, let me venture, you know, into color. And often, you know, I always say that I see things in black and white and in shades, but this was sort of like a provocation for me to work in color. And starting off with the painted faces, you know, it symbolizes, you know, how we all wear masks to get ahead in life, or we all wear masks to conceal our intentions and what have you. But on the same layer as well. I'm also looking at you know, how I can take traditional elements from my society or my culture and how to bring it forward uh, into the future. So for example, if you look at the clothing that she has on the stripe, that's actually a piece of cloth that comes from the South. Now for a Western audience, you just see you know, uh, the patterns or the colors, mm -hmm. but for Ethiopians, there is specific symbols that I've put in there, sort of a, a coding within it that is a combination of the different <coughs> ethnic groups that we have in Ethiopia and combining it within that element. And the most interesting is when I exhibit this work uh, in different parts of the world, there's always a connection point. You know, for example, the Japanese will tell me, you know, this looks sort of like the geisha and so forth. You know, even here in South Africa, you know, someone from the Kosa was telling me that it's, it reminds them of how their spiritual leaders paint themselves white to be closer to the divine. So it's a global sort of look at it, but in a sense, it's just I'm using these forms as a way of creating a canvas. So the women that I select is very specific and you know, the, th the background, the themes, the colors, you know, I mostly work with primary colors, but within that is how do I have that dialogue that, you know, try to sort of, in a sense, take what's inside of me, put it out into the, uh, into the image. So I want to change gears a little bit. Um, in 2014, Ernst & Young published a study documenting that the culture and creative industries in Europe employ seven million people, that they generate 4.2% of their EU's GDP, and that they are such powerful sources of jobs and growth that they provide jobs for nearly 2.5 times more Europeans than the automotive industry. Of note, the highest revenue is generated by a purely cultural sector, visual arts which employ largely young people who have known, no, no, who have knowledge of new technologies. Now Aida is the one who sent me this Ernst & Young report, which I read through, and I was fascinated by this. Um, so you've mentioned as, that as a photographer who works in Ethiopia, you're not running workshops that simply teach photography. You're educating the general population about the fact that art is not just good PR for a country, but that this is a $10 billion industry that can contribute significantly to the economy. Can you speak about your own ventures? So um, from my end, uh, you know, I exist as an artist, but I also exist as uh, <laughs> someone who's interested in social entrepreneurship. And within that, what I'm looking at is you know, right now in Ethiopia, there is massive development, there's massive growth, you know, there's all these um, infrastructural changes that are happening. And my main theory is that, you know, you can have fancy roads and fancy buildings, but if people are not developed in their minds, it's sort of irrelevant at the end. So as the generation is shifting, uh, what I'm looking at is how to make culture part of development. And within the sector that I'm in, which is photography, I'm looking at also the photography industry in Ethiopia. So right now, with the number of photographers that are in the country, um, mm -hmm. what I find extremely frustrating is that, you know, when we have big events, you know, for example, since we're the political capital of the continent with the African Union being there, there's a lot of conferences and meetings and what have you. So just as a basic commercial photographer, a lot of the times it's foreign photographers that are invited into Ethiopia to document uh, these events. And my thing is, when we look at, you know, how do we develop capacity, how do we get our voices out, all of it comes back to education. So when we talk about you know the challenges and whatever, education plays a key component. So when we teach, um, so through the company, I have a company called uh, DFA, which uh, is Desta for Africa. So the Desta stands for, it's an American language called happiness, but it also stands for developing and educating society through art. So 
So what my main um, conversation in the past six years has been, how do we make culture part of the development, but more importantly, how do we address the importance of the creative sector? So even when I found this Ernest and Young article, this was really a tool for me <coughs> to have a conversation with our government, with the corporate, you know, with various institutions, to understand that, for example, we're not an NGO, we're a company. You know, we pay taxes every month, every year. And within that context, it's really, this is the format that I feel that we need to focus on throughout the continent. And as we know, culture is, you know, we're rich in culture in Africa. So if you look at, you know, the theater, dance, if you look at artifacts, photography, even contemporary art and so forth. So within the course of the past few years, we've been giving workshops to develop emerging talents. Outside of that, it's not just developing emerging talents, but it's also to make them understand how the industry functions. And then how do we increase the visibility? So for example, we have Associated Press, Reuters, you know, all these major publications that are coming into town. Instead of sending somebody in, there's already a talent pool that they can pick from in order to engage the international community in that sense. So for me, it wasn't uh, the teaching only, but it was also, we wanted to also teach the audience. So when we organized the Addis Photo Fest, which is we're on our fourth edition, um, and we do it every two years, through the Addis Photo Fest, it became an activity where what I was looking at is that, you know, it wasn't just about me fantasizing about these ideas within my office, but how do we spread this to the general public? So when we do exhibitions, you know, what has been fascinating in the course of the various years is that it has progressively been, you know, growing in numbers, but within that getting the international visibility and also at the same time teaching the government, teaching the audience of the role of photography, that it's not just one thing, but it has various tools. So in the course of everything that I do, you know, my ultimate goal is how do we use visual communication for change? Thank you. Thank you Thank you, Aida. Thank you, Nilika. Okay, so we've come to the halfway point in this discussion about Art for Africa. I tell you what, I don't know about you, but my brain is to take a bit of a rest. Okay, so please do enjoy this coffee and tea outside. We shall return at uh, 12 o'clock exactly. 12 o'clock exactly, please. Thank you.
Our next speaker needs no introduction. His name is William Kentridge. <laughs> so this is the TED Talk, which is a bit terrifying. It reminds one rather of that radio program. Um, 60 seconds, or you have to talk without hesitation, deviation, or repetition <laughs> on a particular subject, and here they've increased the torture to 15 minutes. <laughs> 15 minutes without repetition, deviation, or hesitation about <sighs> But of course, we have to resist the fall, and to encourage hesitation, the repetition, the deviation, <laughs> And it's only on the outside edges of the straight line of thought that we're actually going to find something new and find a way to do it. And the first deviation I want to do is to talk a bit about geography from South African perspective. We can run the next section of the, of the video. And this will be familiar to all of you more than 20 years old or so, or 25 years old, that during the apartheid years, so from when I was born to when I was 40, the world map changed enormously. All the countries which opposed and had a horror for apartheid legislation and its imposition started distancing them from South Africa. Cuba, Mexico, South America disappeared. Ecuador, Brazil, only the dictatorships of Paraguay and Uruguay and Chile under Pinochet stayed there as a, as a point of connection to South Africa. Australia and New Zealand, British colonies, of course, remained. We could travel there, as did Western Europe and North America. But India, impossible to go there. It became a rumor. It disappeared from our, from our maps. The whole of Southeastern Asia, Vietnam, Laos, China itself, impossible, only a rumor. The Soviet Union and all of Eastern Europe, we had to believe there was a distant possibility that on some other planet they were actually there. And then, of course, all of Africa, north of Malawi. South Africa was anathema, and it started disappearing from our maps. We had to fly around it, and in the end, our map was reduced to the ancient, we can pause it there, Ptolemaic map, which just had a few dots for what Africa was, and the rest was seen as unknown and unknowable. And now, 
20 years on, we are still undoing that damage, trying to find a connection to those countries to the north of us, to find out how we fit into the strange object, landmass, and idea of Africa itself. And it's important here that I understand I'm not talking as a historian or a theoretician, but as an artist, and I'm interested in what it is to bring this question of Africa into the studio. Once in the studio, the, the rules of engagement, of argument, change. Here in a lecture hall or in this form, one expects a, a clear line of meaning. It's a linear progression. The argument starts, there are propositions. We have to reach uh, an end point with some form of conclusion, and obviously sentences follow each other, and that becomes the shape of an argument. But in a studio, it's very different. There is not the same pressure to be logical. So here I would describe to you the invention of Africa. And historians and theoreticians say, tell us that Africa has been invented six times. It, Africa was first invented in 137 AD with Ptolemy's map of the known world, which had Egypt at the top, and then everything below it described as unknown and unknown. And this was very much an image of Africa for many centuries. Then Africa was invented for the second time with the spread of Islam from the Arabian Peninsula into northern Africa where maps started getting larger and a larger land mass was seen as Africa. Then in the early modern era where navigators went with ships around the edge, the continent was defined as a line, as an outline, in which people would know the very edge but everything inside was unknown. But here it became a continent. And it's important, again, that each time it's being seen from outside. It's being reduced in size to something that fits on two pages of an atlas, the way an outline does. Africa as if it's a blank mask, which we just know the outside shape of. Then, of course, in the colonial era, in the 19th century, you have all of Europe coming into the center of Africa and carving it up and making the ge geographical and political boundaries which still exist and exporting all the wealth of, of the country. And then for a fifth time, Africa is reinvented in the 1920s when descendants of Africa in America, descendants of slaves, but again from outside of Africa, define Africa through Pan-Africanism. Again, seen as a single entity, which of course echoes much later in the 1950s and 60s with different liberation movements that take the idea of a Pan-Africanism. But let us say that it exists in the studio as a series of impossible questions. How does one try to put together the different languages, traditions, religions, geographic areas, different histories? And in fact, one understands that it can only exist as a conversation, as a topic, as a kind of cacophony of different elements that have to come together. And that whereas one thinks of a lecture like this as a, a single stream of thought, whether it's a stream of consciousness of different ideas following each other, it's nonetheless reduced to a single line of one voice talking continually. In the studio, we can start to imagine what would it be if one loses a single stream and rather has a kind of highway of consciousness of different ideas knocking into each other, overtaking, taking different offerings. We can play the next video, please, Christoph. So this would be to imagine how does one get all the different elements and thoughts that accompany uh, the idea of Africa. The invention of Africa. Berlin, there, he explains 1938, the first 19, 1915. Picasso on safari. Paris, Africa has been invented six times. To make it louder. The, the second invention in the 1980s and 1980s is still in dispute because it's historians are led against the newspapers, the Nyasaland Times. Keeping on your because feet. to accept these Africa images versus the Africans in the separation of present law, the panoply of laws and laws made by the government with its map of the ethical demand and other parts of Africa, in the face of it, what it would be for everyone to be equal number of African to the south. Sarastro. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 
understand that both of these all of end of story end of story end of story end of story So Africa comes into the studio, and it comes into the studio in the form of letters, Chilembwe's letter about the Nyasaland revolt of 1915, newspaper articles about the Italian war in Ethiopia in the 1930s, maps, photos, the story of Plato and the idea of the Enlightenment and bringing light to the dark continent. So the political working out of Plato's ideas, which is colonialism, and then settler colonialism in South Africa, and then myself at the end of settler colonialism as a white person in South Africa, and what is the collusion and complicity to be here in this place. All of these things come into the studio. What is the relationship of China to Africa now? Is it a new form of colonialism? Is it going to build infrastructure but take the wealth out as the cost for that? Also on the list in the studio are a list of proverbs from Ghana. The head and the load are the troubles of the neck. One should not be too hopeful of a ship sailing from Europe. <laughs> One who has seen a thousand will never be satisfied with a hundred. If the good doctor can't cure you, find a less good doctor. <laughs> now in the studio, these of course, they need charcoal, they need paper, they need ink, they need sculpture, they need words, as we've just seen, they need video. And the thinking about the topic becomes a thinking in material. What is the kind of mark that's needed? How absorbent is the paper of the ink? What is the kind of performance of the people on the stage with the, with the work? And what keeps coming back is that Ghanaian problem. When the good doctor can't cure you, find the less good doctor. The task is to find the less good idea. One knows the danger of confident men with their good ideas and the damage this does every time. And in the studio, the meeting of the idea and the material means that you have to give yourself over to the material, to the logic of the material. What does the charcoal do? What are the images that are suggested by the material? So you may start with a very clear theme or a clear idea, and in the process of working, something else happens. The main idea gets pushed to the side and other things emerge from the process of working. And this is what I would call the less good idea or the secondary process. And this for me is always key in the studio, to allow a space for this to emerge. And that means allowing the studio to be a safe space for stupidity, mm -hmm. to allow stupid ideas the benefit of the doubt, to see what happens. There may be something interesting. If you put four men talking on top of each other together, maybe there'll be a sense of, yes, we have to find a place for polyphony, for many voices for different solutions. So it's thinking about things in the studio, and that both gives solutions of what can go out of the studio, but they also have echoes in the outside world. If the good ideas of the good doctor aren't curing us, what are a series of less good ideas? What are the ways of multiple other different ideas that can uh, solve problems? So the studio both becomes a way of thinking in material, and it also becomes a kind of metaphor for making understanding aesthetic, moral, and political outside the techniques and the strategies of the studio. And the hope has to be in the polyphony, in the chaos of the different fragments coming together. One knows that every clear statement is always a simplification <coughs> or a falsehood. And every clear statement from Plato onwards has to have someone with a gun standing next to it supporting that idea. And we also understand that the ideas come into the studio, but the studio becomes a kind of membrane. The walls of the studio with the photographs, the texts, the memories that are there are a kind of midway line between the outside world and in the studio, the artist, and outside the world, other people observing the world. So that a letter will come from the 1915, reading John Chalembwe's letter to the Nyasad and time about the use of, of African soldiers in the First World War. 
And this then gets met, not just by a blankness on our part, but by all the things that are already in us. Memories of, of the First World War. Surprises at our ignorance of not knowing about the First World War in Africa. Filling in gaps that would be known to be someone in Nyasa land, but which are absent to us. So that the final meaning, whether it's a drawing or reading of a newspaper, is always a negotiation between what comes towards us in the world and what we project onto that that image, either to make the drawing or to read the drawing when it comes out. And this intermediate space, understanding how we are also agents of our understanding and of construction of meaning, of what it is to construct a possible sense of what it is either to be a Johannesburger or a South African or an African, is there as an act of work to be done in the studio. We're going to conclude with a few fragments of what this kind of thinking in material could look like. We can run the next section of the video. <coughs> and I will run over time. Oh. Oh. writer, editor at Africa as a Country. Please welcome her back to the stage, Nilika Chawardhan. When the 
well-respected British arts journalist visiting a New York City gallery, one known for exhibiting African photographer's work, was introduced to me. His response was not, nice to meet you. It was, oh, I'm not going to remember that. I responded, I'm not going to remember your name either. He looked sufficiently perturbed. Then there was a South African administrator in the arts department at Stellenbosch University, who is now at an even higher post at the University of Cape Town. She was asked to introduce me at an international conference, one meant to question unequal distributions of power, erasures of colonial bodies, and structures meant to maintain less powerful groups behind visible and invisible barriers. She got up on the podium and said, yeah, I can't say it, and looked exasperated with me for having such a difficult name. And just a week ago, a colleague at my home university in New York introduced me to her husband at a housewarming party for another colleague. This is Nilika. I can't say your last name. Again, the exasperated look, the dramatic gesture. That second part of our introduction was wholly unnecessary. It accentuated my otherness and marked her own subjectivity as the norm. She was not required to bother to learn my name or find a creative way of not having to say it. It required that I laugh and make a creative little joke about not being able to pronounce her Italian-American surname either, although I can. I'm just as guilty. Recently, whilst I was viewing a show at a Cape Town gallery, I mixed up the name of artist and curator Sisipo Ngodwana with that name of her colleague Sinazo, to whom I'd just been introduced. Now, I'd met dozens of new people that week, and it was an honest mistake. But my mistake sat with me on the plane back to New York. When I returned, I sent her a note of apology with no qualifications or excuses. She was gracious. We were able to have a conversation about how both of us have dealt with these moments of erasure. Or as she said, we usually brush off these encounters because people not only violate you, but they also train you to be accepting of violence. Although my parents were born and brought up in Sri Lanka, I was raised and educated in Zambia. My father was educated in Moscow during the Khrushchev years when two powerful nations were vying for the third world's attention, hearts, and minds. But because his degree was worth little outside of Soviet-friendly nations, he was not able to get a job in England where many ambitious young men from the so-called Commonwealth immigrated. When I was worried about my own job prospects, he told me an apocryphal story. In 1971, he sent applications for jobs in Southern Africa, including one to what later became the Zambia Consolidated Copper Mines. But it was only eight years later that he heard back from them. <laughs> when the mines changed their policy about not hiring non-white expatriates. Because of this sudden change in a racist policy, I grew up in Zambia with children whose names reflected complex personal geographies. Subsequently, I went to the United States for university, buoyed by my father's hopes and dreams. I now teach literature at a university in a rural part of New York State and travel often to South Africa for my own work as an arts writer. My name, including my clan name, get ready for it, <laughs> is Paliya Wadana Arachige Manori Nilika Jayawadana. <laughs> Not all the history that comes with that name has been honorable or good, but it is mine. Not all the history in a name is ever good or honorable. However, I'm better able to shape my future because I know where I came from. My name's roots are in Pali, an ancient Indo-Aryan vernacular dialect, 
For those who are not familiar with South Asian languages, the phonemes common to Pali present difficulty. Knowing this, I usually map out the syllabic breaks and stresses for my American university students, who, though they pronounce my name hilariously and badly sometimes, always make the respect, respectful attempt. But that's because they know there's a difference in power between us in the classroom. <laughs> I make sure they know that. <laughs> However, when I travel, when my body is in, and person is in transit, I don't have that protection. Living a life out of place meant that I became an adept negotiator between cultures and languages. I'm always answering questions about my otherness, laboring to ease my complexity for those who believe their stability, the gift of having been born within networks of power was the norm. On some occasions, my movement away from my family's home location enhanced my subjectivity, especially as I began to travel with a modicum of power. Power achieved through education, a green card and now citizenship connecting me to a politically powerful country, or networks of support that recognized and respected my difference. But more often, I experienced dislocation. To deal with those moments, I developed good humor. But I also learned how to set boundaries, to know when good humor has become a coping mechanism to deal with painful moments of exclusion and erasure to recognize when being funny is about accepting too little, playing along as the good black, the model immigrant, the nice native, making things easy for the dominant group, that negotiating the minefield of difference levies a psychological, mental, and physiological tax that left me intellectually exhausted and emotionally broke. I learned that being funny is labor that compensates for the work that persons belonging to the dominant group do not have to do and does not want to do. Many of us have a version of a many-nationed narrative. We became travelers and explorers because ambition pushed us to, and because impossible political, economic, and environmental realities forced our hand. We mobilized ourselves through worlds that actively resisted our entry, and now we find ourselves living and working in locations where our names and our cultural histories are unfamiliar with people who do not necessarily regard us as worthwhile enough to pronounce. Most of us who have experienced lives marked by our racial, ethnic, or linguistic otherness brush off an incorrect pronunciation. Those sometimes hilarious mispronunciations are part of our everyday. It's a negotiation we've come to expect and for which we prepare ourselves, because dominant groups don't question what their privilege and power allow them to get away with. Difficulty is the alibi that we most often use for not attempting to learn someone's name. That refusal to even attempt to pronounce the other is of course a one-way privilege. That refusal irks me. Another one of the luxuries of being a part of power is in assuming that the other must educate and explain. I'm often expected to do the uncompensated labor of educating people about my personal immigration history, as well as my name, whether I find myself in one of those horrendous after work parties, <laughs> which we've all experienced, or trying to share a lap lane at the pool with a strange man, or naked and sweating in some sauna. That's really happened. <laughs> For that reason, one of my friends, Sophia Arzeb, who is Palestinian Egyptian and now works at New York University, prefers to let people mispronounce. Her name begins with a voiced epiglottal fricative or trill. She says she often dumbs it down to Arzeb or Azeb to avoid being off 3,000 times to repeat it so someone else can practice saying it. Because the labor that's necessary to teach others to pronounce her name, she says she actually prefers it to being consistently mispronounced than feeling pressured to educate strangers on how to articulate a sound that exists only in a handful of global languages. <laughs> we, when we articulate a name, we are hailing the person to whom that name belongs. To hail someone, is to recognize her person fully 
We are recognizing an entire worldview that comes with those phonemes. We are calling out to the ancestors that cultivated the sonic landscapes of her personhood, the word culture that shaped her ways of being in the world and the future she dreams of fashioning. In my home culture in Sri Lanka, we are named using the phonemes that an astrologer determines at our birth will attract good energy and fortune into our lives. My colleague, Palesa Motsumi, tells me that in Sesotho culture, we are named often after our forefathers as well as according to the events taking place during a birth. There is a ceremony done to welcome the child into this earthly life and to inform our ancestors about the new member of the family. In this way, we acknowledge many lives through naming. Names can even map out the ways in which the bearer's future lies. When we are asked to flatten out our names, we are being asked to compact and reduce rich layers of context that are embedded in us. We are being asked to make ourselves simpler, more digestible for those who do not want to deal with complexity or difference. It means we are seen as something that remains so other that we remain unpronounceable. And we comply out of necessity to ease our passages in the world. Pronouncing a name or choosing not to is indicative of whether people are willing to be respectful of our integrity in other ways too. It speaks miles about whether they want to develop a relationship with us and our work, rather than reshape us into easy to consume commodities. As a person who is clearly marked as a racialized subject, as an other who finds myself often in transit, I now specifically ask those I encounter to make a respectful attempt, if not a perfect one, to pronounce my name. This may be a symbolic act, but it is an important step in setting expectations and boundaries for how we will subsequently encounter each other. Sometimes people are not going to like you for having a clear sense of limits, so expect resistance or scoffing when you articulate limits and expectations about labor, compensation, of how to behave respectfully towards one's work and one's own person. Expect pushback, especially if you're a woman, a black woman, and an artist. Expect to get a reputation. <laughs> but expect also to have a dignified relationship with yourself. Expect to hold your head as you wish to when you walk into your future, rather than have others turn it where they wish for it to go or push it down to indignity. We still hear <coughs> conflicting messages about Africa. Either we are Africa rising, a useful commodity, or Africa still dysfunctional, Africa to be saved and conquered. What's true is that those of us who have ties to African landscapes are now more in charge of how we construct ourselves. As we enter the multi-billion dollar industry that is the art world, it is imperative that artists, writers, and curators set their own limits and boundaries that will help us maintain our self-respect and dignity for an art professional working with African and diasporic artists. Not pronouncing respectfully means that one is not accurately engaging in the necessary discourse. For a collector, it means that they have not created as fulfilling and rich a relationship with the aesthetic works in which they have invested financially as they could. We now have an opportunity to think about how cultural producers and artists of our time might reframe erroneous but powerful mythologies about Africans. Those reductive narratives about, about us are not going to change if we dumb down what we call ourselves and succumb to someone else's arrogance, which demands a more palatable version of our persons. It's more important that we challenge the powerful desires and motives of the market rather than have the market reduce how we are seen. We should roll out into the world with all the complexity of our names and our beings and the histories that created those beautiful and painful sounds that resonate within us.
much. So as I said in the beginning, my name is Ita Deng Hong. <laughs> Um, so we're going to ask for your pardon as we have a little bit of an admin situation to work with here. But uh, Kosi Agassi is another one of our speakers who unfortunately cannot be with us today, again, because of circumstances beyond our control. Uh, we do also have a TED video to play in this place. Uh, this time around, it challenges the notion of what our understanding of a museum is, an art museum. So please do enjoy. We stop. The world is filled with incredible objects and rich cultural heritage. And when we get access to them, we are blown away. We fall in love. But most of the time, the world's population is living without real access to arts and culture. What might the connections be when we start exploring our heritage, the beautiful locations, and the art in this world? Before we get started in this presentation, I just want to take care of a few housekeeping points. First is I'm no expert in art or culture. I fell into this by mistake, but I'm loving it. <laughs> Secondly, all what I'm going to show you belongs to the amazing museums, archives, and foundations that we partner with. None of this belongs to Google. And finally, what you see behind me is available right now on your mobile phones, on your laptops. This is our current platform where you can explore thousands of museums and objects at your fingertips in extremely high definition detail. The diversity of the content is what's amazing. If we just had European paintings, if we just had modern art, I think it gets a bit boring. For example, we this month launched the Black History Channel uh, with 82 curated exhibitions which talk about arts and culture in that community. We also have some amazing objects from Japan around craftsmanship in Japan called Made in Japan. And one of my you know, favorite uh, exhibitions, which actually is the idea of my talk, is I didn't expect to become a fan of Japanese dolls. But I am. And thanks to this exhibition that has really taught me what is the craftsmanship behind the soul of a Japanese doll. Trust me, it's very exciting. Take my word for it. So, moving on swiftly, one quick thing I wanted to just showcase in this platform, which you can share with your kids and your friends right now, is you can travel to all these amazing institutions virtually as well. So one of our recent ideas was with the Guggenheim Museum in New York, where you, know, you can actually get a taste of what it might feel like to actually be there. You can go to the ground floor, and obviously most of you, I assume, have been there, and you can see the architectural masterpiece that it is. But imagine this accessibility for a kid in Bombay who's studying architecture, you know, who hasn't had a chance to go to the Guggenheim as yet. You can obviously look at objects in the Guggenheim Museum. You can obviously get into them and so on and so forth. There's a lot of information here, but this is not the purpose of my talk today. This exists right now. What we now have are the building blocks to a very exciting future when it comes to arts and culture and accessibility to arts and culture. So I'm joined today on stage by my good friend and artist in residence at our office in Paris, Cyril Dian, who is the professor of interactive design at Ecole University in Lausanne, Switzerland. And what Cyril and our team of engineers have been doing is trying to find these connections and trying to visualize a few of these. So I'm going to go quite quick now. This object you see behind me, oh, just, yes, clarification. Always seeing the real thing is better, in case people try to think I'm replicating the real thing. Okay, so moving on. This object you see behind me is the Venus of Barakatran. It's one of the oldest objects in the world, around 233,000 years ago, found in the Golan Heights and currently residing at the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. It is also one of the oldest objects on our platform. So let's assume we start from this one object. And what if we zoomed out and actually tried to experience our own cultural Big Bang? What might that look like? 
This is what we deal with on a daily basis at the Cultural Institute. Over six million cultural artifacts curated and given to us by institutions to actually make these connections. You can travel through time, you can understand more about our society through these. We can obviously you know, look at it from the perspective of you know, our planet and try to see how it might look without borders if we just organize art and culture. We can also then plot it by time, which obviously, you know, for the data geek in me is very fascinating and you can spend hours looking at every decade and the contributions in that decade and in those years for art, history and cultures. You know, we would love to spend hours showing you each and every decade, but we don't have the time right now. So you can go on your uh, phone and actually do it yourself. But if, if, if you don't mind, and you can hold your applause till later, I don't want to run out of time because I want to show you a lot of cool stuff. So just very quickly. Uh, so you can move on from here, obviously, to another very interesting idea. So beyond the pretty picture, Beyond the nice visualization, what is the purpose? How is this useful? And this next idea comes from uh, discussions with curators that we've been having at museums, who, by the way, I've fallen in love with because they dedicate their whole life to actually trying to tell these stories. And one of the curators told me, Amit, what would it be like if you could create a virtual curator's table where all these six million objects are displayed in a way for us to look at the connections between them? And let's start. You can spend a lot of time, trust me, looking at different objects and understanding where they come from. It's, 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 a, it's a crazy matrix experience. But you know, let, just moving on, let's take you know, the world famous Vincent van Gogh, you know, who is you know, obviously very well represented on this platform. Thanks to the diversity of the institutions we have, we have over 211 high definition, amazing artworks by this artist now organized in one beautiful view. And as it resolves, and as Cyril goes deeper, you can see obviously all the self-portraits, you can see still life. But I just wanted to highlight one very quick example, which is very timely, the bedroom. This is an artwork that three copies exist, one at the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam, one at the Orsay in Paris, and one at the Art Institute of Chicago, which actually currently is hosting a reunion of all three artworks physically, I think for only the second time ever. But it is united digitally and virtually for anybody to look at in a very different way, and you won't get pushed in the line in the crowd. <laughs> so let's take you and let's travel through the bedroom very quickly so you can experience what we are doing for every single object. We want the image to speak as much as it can on a digital platform. And all you need is an internet connection and a computer. And Cyril, if you could go deeper quickly, I'm sorry, this is all live, so you know you have to give Cyril a little bit of, yeah. And this is available for every object: modern art, contemporary art, Renaissance, you name it, even sculpture. Sometimes you don't know what can attract you to an artwork or to a museum or to you know a cultural uh, discovery. Uh, so for me, personally, it was quite a challenge because when I decided to make this my full-time job at Google, my mother was not very supportive. Uh, I love my mother, but she thought I was wasting my life with this museum stuff. Uh, and you know, for her, a museum is what you do when you go on vacation and you tick mark and it's over, right? And so you know, it took around four and a half years for me to convince my lovely Indian mother that actually this is worthwhile. And the way I did it was I realized one day that she loves gold. And so I started showing her all objects that had the material gold in them. And the first thing my mom asks me is, how can we buy these? And, you know, and obviously, you know, my salary is not that high, so you know, I was like, we can't actually do that, mom, but you can explore them virtually. And so now my mom, every time I meet her, she's asking me, any more gold, any more silver in your project, can you show me? And that's the idea I'm trying to illustrate. It does not matter how you get in, as long as you get in. Once you get in, you're hooked. So moving on from here very quickly, is a, a kind of a playful idea, actually, to illustrate the point of access. And I'm going to go quite quickly on this one. We all know that seeing the artwork in person is amazing. But we also know that most of us can't do it. And even the ones that can and can afford to do it, it's complicated. So, so can we just load up our uh, art trip, uh, whatever we call it. We don't have a good name for this. But uh, essentially, you know, 
let's, let's, uh, so we have around 1,000 amazing institutions, 68 countries, but let's start with Rembrandt. Uh, we might have time for only one example, but thanks to the diversity, right, we've got around 500 amazing Rembrandt object artworks from 46 institutions in 17 countries. And let's say you, on your next vacation, want to go see every single one of them. That is your itinerary. You will probably travel 53,000 kilometers, visit around, I think, 46 institutions, and just FII, you might release 10 tons of CO2 emissions. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but remember, it's art, so you can justify it, perhaps, in some way. So, mo moving on, you know, swiftly from here is something a little bit more technical and more interesting. So, all what we've showed you so far uses metadata, right, to make the connections. But obviously, we have something cool nowadays that everyone likes to talk about, which is machine learning, right? And so what we thought is, you know what, let's strip out all the metadata, and you know, let's look at what machine learning can do based purely on visual recognition of this entire collection. And what we ended up with is this very interesting map, this clusters that has no reference point information, but has just used visuals to kind of cluster things together. Each cluster is an hour, two hours by itself of discovery. But one of the clusters we want to show you very quickly is this amazing cluster of portraits that we found from museums around the world. If you could zoom in a little bit more, Cyril, you know, just to show you, you, know, you can just be traveling through portraits. And essentially, you can do nature, you can do horses, and the clusters you know, galore. So when we saw all these portraits, we were like, hey, can we do something fun for kids? Or can we just do something playful, you know, to get people interested in portraits? Because I haven't really seen, you know, like young kids really excited to go to a portrait gallery, you know? So I want to try and figure something out. So we created something called the Portrait Matcher. Uh, it's quite self-explanatory, so I'm just going to let Cyril, you know, show his beautiful face. And essentially what's happening is with the movement of his head, we are matching different portraits, you know, around the world from museums. And, you know... I... <laughs> and I don't know about you, but I've shown it to my you know, nephew and stuff, and the reaction is just phenomenal. All they ask me is, when can we go see this? <laughs> and by the way, if you're nice, maybe Cyril, you can smile and find the happy one? Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> by the way, this is not rehearsed. So, congrats, sir. All right, great. St oh wow. Okay, let's let's move on. Otherwise, this will just take the whole time. So, art and culture can be fun, also, right? All right. So, for for our last quick uh, experiment, we call all of these experiments. Our last quick experiment comes back to machine learning. So, we show you clusters, visual clusters. But what if we could ask the machine to also name these clusters? What if it could automatically tag them using no actual metadata? So what we have is this kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, explorer where we have managed to match around, I think, 4,000 labels. And you know, we haven't really you know, done anything special here, just fed the collection. And we found interesting categories. We can start with horses, you know, very straightforward you know, category. You would expect to see that the machine has put images of horses, right? And it has, but you also notice right over there that it has a very abstract image that it has still managed to recognize and cluster as horses. We also have an amazing head in terms of, of a horse, and each one of these has the tags as to why it got categorized in this. So let's move to another one which I found very uh, funny and very interesting uh, because I didn't understand how this category came up. It's called Lady in Waiting. So, you know, if Cyril, we do it very quickly, you know, you will see that we have these amazing, you know, images of ladies, I guess, in waiting or posing, I don't really understand it, but I've been trying to ask my museum contacts, you know, what, what is this, what's going on here? And it's fascinating. Uh, coming back to gold very quickly, uh, you know, I wanted to search for gold, right, and see how the machine tagged all the gold, but actually it doesn't tag it as gold. We are living in popular times. It tags it as bling bling. <laughs> so, I'm being hard on Cyril because I'm moving too fast. Uh, but essentially, here you have all the bling bling of the world's museums, you know, organized for you. And finally, to end this uh, talk and these experiments, which I hope you feel after this talk, is happiness and emotion. And what would we see when we see happiness? 
And so uh, if you actually look at all the objects that have been tagged under happiness, obviously you would expect you know, happiness, happiness, I guess. But there was one that came up that was very fascinating and interesting, uh, which was this artwork by Douglas Copeland, our friend and artist in residence as well, called I Miss My Pre-Internet Brain. And I don't know why the machine feels like it misses its pre-internet brain as being tagged here, but you know, it's a very interesting thought. I mean, I sometimes do miss my pre-internet brain, but not when it comes to exploring arts and culture online. So take out your phones, take out your computers, go visit museums, and just a quick call out to all the amazing archivists, historians, curators, who are sitting in museums, preserving all this culture, and the least we can do is get our daily dose of art and culture for ourselves and our kids. Thank you. missing a pair of shades. Um, a pair of shades, I have them with me. So please just come over um, and let me know. So, um, you know, with direction from TED, uh, we at TEDx Johannesburg have been looking for, and we know that at some point, the talking head format of a TED talk Will, will be sorted out by some other cooler, hipper, fresher idea, right? That's gonna happen. So, so maybe the way to stop that from happening is for TED and TEDx to keep reinventing themselves. So one of the things that we've done is, or we've been trying to do really, is to, to find artists, for example, in their own studios doing their work and somehow beam them into a TEDx talk, right? So we've done exactly that. Well, almost. We were going to <laughs> beam live into the studio. Sorry, my sister, I know you're watching. Siwane. Uh, but we decided, you know what, maybe we should pre record it shortly before we have the live event, just to make sure that we don't spoil your experience of it. And we've done exactly that. She's a performance artist and member of the Ikriya Arts Collective, the South African who's currently in Zurich and she's about to share her idea with us. Are we ready, Gustav? Yes. Yes? yes. The other book. So, I suppose conceiving and reviewing has been integral to the learning pattern for almost as long as I can remember, since my transition into being in Um How to balance the two of the knowledge that I carry about responsibility? One, to my own energy, and two, the energy people exude to the responsibility of knowing that if I reveal too much, this knowledge may be used negatively, has always been one way I constantly find myself trying to traverse this tough terrain. Um, I suppose the story should start at the very beginning about how I began performing and concealing a secret that is formal, which is not actually a secretive, just a few things are secretive. Um, others, people find scary, so they don't want to engage in. My role was to force people to interrogate the secret, 
so that it is no longer something that belongs to the Tao continent. But to them as well, it is for that reason that I want to give you the story. I've inherited many stories, stories from other generations who complete my genetic makeup. These men and women are both dead and alive, like myself, who has inherited the liminal space. I am them and they are me. It is a very symbiotic relationship. How is this possible? As you already know, I'm a relatively young artist and designer. I make work about journeys. I've been on quite a few, so I'd like to take you on mine. Uh, a few years ago, I was sitting at home with a whole lot of application forms to a number of universities across the country. My parents did not ask me whether I had applied or not, so I guess when I asked my father to download all these forms at work, he was slightly taken aback. We had not had this conversation about which university to go to, whether I'm going to the university, but I guess in the way that we were acting with each other, it was implied. I was doing everything by myself. I went to the universities I could physically go to, and I had these forms in. I was provisionally accepted by the universities. Everyone at home assumed I would be studying law. All the things I was there for. They don't really know how I wanted to study fine art. And what was my third choice? And when I finally told them this, no one said no. The fact that I was given an education was enough for my family. Three years into my studies, and I was still a lazy and talented student that the lecturers appeared to be giving up on. I was the bane of their existence because you know you can only help someone go so far. You can only tell someone to do this and that, and it's their choice whether they can, whether they do it or they don't. You can lead a horse to water, you know, but make a drink. It's the same kind of story. Um, so I think it was three years into my studies and I was still a lazy student um, and I figured I'm tired of being an average artist, I'm tired of being the average student, I'm tired of the 60s and 50s because you know when you go into art school they make you look to the person who's to the right and to the left and they tell you that only one out of every ten of you are going to be an artist, and I didn't want to be the nine. So I didn't know what the point of me being average because I was trying to do my best at this lazy point to write this study. I could listen attentively in lectures, information was seeping through my brain. A few months later, I got into a car accident in which I blacked out and I tried to. I had a passenger off and we both worked out to um, This alerted me to something that was much deeper that was going on because everybody could just have said, no, you weren't looking good. You know, there's always an excuse for something. But I thought to myself, there's something deeper happening here. And that evening, when I got home, I spoke to my mother because the only thing I remember about that accident is that this car was driving 120 kilometers per hour in front of me and bear is not here and I was right behind it and it just stopped. Well the light was green. Uh, and I don't remember hitting it, I don't remember the impact, I just remember that the car was totaled. Um, in the days that followed, my mother sat me down and asked me about something that I had been requesting. The request was taken at face value, I think, for a while, but at that point in time, she also had a realization that maybe something else was going on. And the request was I wanted to see someone. Uh, the very next day, we drove to meet one, and he was surprised that I was still alive and standing. Because given the magnitude of the calling, my calling, I should have been doing it even more. So 
Suddenly everything began to make sense. Who I was and how I arrived at that particular juncture, I'm sure that made sense, did not make sense to my father, who I didn't speak to for four years. Why I was not taking my spiritual journey, my father and I had very minimal contact, not at all, what are you doing? Nothing. So it was the end, I realized that this journey that I was on was a very nebulous one, which addressed a lot of things around religion, race, history, culture, and sexuality. Being a spiritualist is always a point of entry for me regarding my work and my life. My spiritual well being shifted and so did the work that I was making, which meant because it was better than sincere, I was making better before the work. With the average student gone, disappeared, the work progressed and I had appeared. The entity that is in front of you right now is always in between. In some part, communicating with those who are physically absent. Wherever I choose to go, I have given a 
to a curator's home for dinner. It's probably about, I don't know, not more than four years ago. It was a really lovely evening, very intimate, about seven, not more than 10 people. Um, great food, lovely wine. I remember talking to the curator's husband, a prof I think my, ah, a professor at the local university. And 
As a matter of fact, in conversation, the professor looked at me and said, the reason why black people were slaves is because their bodies were made for slavery. So his words landed with the force of a boxer's punch in my stomach, taking the air out of my breath, out of my lungs. And with those words, what he did is he erased me. Standing right there in front of him, he just completely erased me by saying that my physicality, my being, my history was just slavery. What he was doing was also echoing what a lot of people believe and what is still uh, what is probably still taught in some universities that. <coughs> That all called <laughs> Sorry. Can I take this off? Okay. Thanks. Okay. So when you were saying that, Sorry, yeah. took the air out of my lungs and he was echoing what a lot of people are still taught and a lot of people still believe that before colonization there was only darkness on the African continent. Maya Angelou said the function, the very serious function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you over and over having to explain yourself. Someone says you have no language, so you spend 20 years proving that you do. Someone says your head isn't shaped right, so you bring out all the scientists to prove that it is. Someone says you have no art, so you dredge that up. Someone says you have no kingdoms, so you dredge that up. None of it is necessary, and there will always be one more thing. I'm trying to go to the next slide. There. This work is titled Makubu. Makubu means waves or ripples. What I do here is I write with red pencil, on the white gallery walls. I write three circles. Oh, yeah. I'm not too sure where to point. Three circles. I spend one day writing three concentric circles, then I come back the next day, erase what had been written, then I come back the third day and write over what had been erased, I come back the fourth day, and erase what had been written. When I did this performance at Eneva in London, I spent six days. So three days of writing and three days of erasing, and what is left is a faded circle drawing. And in the content of the circles in London, I was concentrating on how Negative stereotypes are a way of erasing black female subjectivity and black female excellence. So what I wrote, for example, in the middle circle particularly was, I'm more than my gender, I'm more than my race, I'm a black female archaeologist, I'm a black female scientist, I'm a black female philosopher. So I went through this spectrum of um, the spectrum of spaces that black females have excelled. And here I also concentrate on labor. So making the circles is a very performative act because it involves the body. 
I stretch and I bend as I make the circle. And the plinth is there to catch. Back. No. No. <laughs> yes, thank you. The plinth is there to catch the evidence of labor. So I'm also interested in what happens when the performing body is present and what happens when the performing body is absent. So here, the plinth catches, the next slide please. Here the, thank you. The plinth catches the erasers. <coughs> you can see the evidence of the pencils having been sharpened. You see the big um, eraser that's, that's becoming smaller. I think creation is a physical act. I think even the creation of ideas is, is connected to your physicality because your physicality in, because your physicality determines how you move through the world. The next slide, please. This work is titled Mosako Wanako. That means a circle of time. What I do here is I sit for six hours from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. and I crochet. Now six hours because I think that's a full working day, uh, minus the tea breaks or the lunch break. So I do this for six hours for 10 days, no breaks. For those six hours in a day for 10 days, I do not take toilet breaks, I don't take water breaks, I don't take lunch breaks, no breaks. And what I do is crochet. The next slide, please. This here is about, I think, 12 meters long. As I'm sitting there and crocheting, I pay particular attention to what it is that's happening in my body, what's happening in my head, and what's happening in my emotions. And I try to reflect that on the carpet. I do this using a few techniques. So I, one, I used about three different types of reds in this carpet. I also use three different types of needles, and I also use about four to five different types of um, crocheting techniques, so that if I'm feeling tired, if I'm feeling sleepy, if I'm feeling hungry, if an idea is going through my head, that gets reflected on the carpet. For me, the carpet becomes a monument to silent labor and unrecognized lives of millions of people who have contributed to world history, whose lives and labor make it possible for us to have spaces of privilege and exclusive spaces. The next slide, please. This work, so, I work in gallery spaces, in the white cube space. And in conceptualizing my work, the white cube space, gallery spaces, are symbolic of spaces of exclusion and spaces of privilege. Here the work is called Seritise. Seritise means this shadow, sorry, this dignity, this honor, this aura, this nobility. And what I do is I write with <coughs> black on a white wall. I've spent about close to two years researching women of color who have been erased out of world history. I've got a list, it's close to 130 women. So these are the women who are warrior queens, uh, or queens, there are scientists, philanthropists, they are ast astronauts, they have done amazing things for the world. They have contributed amazingly to world history but are not reflected within their history books. So what I do is write the names on the wall. Now, I've done this performance uh, in Berlin and in Johannesburg, and in both spaces, 
it's three lines of names at the top and two lines of names at the bottom. Next slide, please. And what I do, the performing body becomes the public. I ask the public to erase a name. So what I ask them to stand back, contemplate the wall, pick a name, and then enact violence by erasing it. When I did this performance in Berlin, I'm also forgetting to mention that the performing body here becomes active. When you erase a name, you don't do this because there are no names in this comfortable space. The, the audience has to either stand on their tiptoes, climb on something, so the body becomes active, or bend down and erase. Now when I did this in Berlin, the audience reaction was very different from the audience reaction in Johannesburg. In Berlin, I think the idea that these amazing women of colors were not part of our history books was an act of violence, was somehow a new concept to us. They understood it, but it was somehow new. So they were very reluctant to erase names and make visible that violence. While here in Johannesburg, the audience was very enthusiastic in making that violence visible because the idea that it's violent for these women not to be in our world history books was not something new to them. And more importantly, they were looking forward to undoing that violence by taking ownership of a name and going home and finding out who this person is. Because I don't provide any information as to who these women are, since everyone can Google that information. So the audience erases a name, and by doing so, they take ownership of the name. I think that it's our individual responsibility to educate ourselves. And I think in doing so, then we challenge our biases and <coughs> ignorances. And I think the more inclusive our world history books become, the greater our ability to minimize the violence of historical erasure. The absence of these women and other marginalized people from our history books means that the picture that we paint through the stories we tell about who we are as a people is incomplete. And that means the global vision as a pe the, the vision we have as a global people is misleading at best. Audre Lorde said, it is not our differences that divide us. It's our inability to recognize accept and celebrate those differences. Thank you. Can I make a special request that we applaud her patience and her power again? Video, so we'll be able to, you know, cut out what, what didn't work. Um, good stuff. Can we just before we go on to the next talk, can we just make sure that the clicker works? Do we have a? Okay. larger than life, and she enjoys the most beautifully balanced relationship with her partner and husband, Fred Jovita. Please welcome Pamela Joyner to the tradition. It is such a pleasure to be here in Johannesburg. I think I've spent almost every minute of every day since I've been here. 
telling people how much I feel at home. So if you don't mind, I'd like to turn that around a little bit and ask you during our time together to imagine that you are in my home in San Francisco. Fred and I love inviting art lovers to our home to share our artist and our collection. I used to start these visits by saying, we do not have a greatest hits collection. Our walls are full of artists you've never heard of. Today I start that talk by saying exactly the same thing, but the suffix is these are Oh, sorry. Sorry. Wow. I'll take the whole thing off. Take it from the beginning. Come off the stage first. Okay. together today, I'd like to ask you to take a virtual trip with me to my home that I share with my husband, Fred Jafrida, in San Francisco, California. When I invite collectors and art lovers to our home, I usually start by saying, we do not own a collection of greatest hits. Our walls are full of artists that you never heard of. The good news is that today I start to talk by saying we do not own a collection of greatest hits and our walls are full of artists you never heard of until recently. <laughs> so ours is a mission-driven collection with no smaller ambition than to reframe art history and make certain to the extent of our capabilities and resources that our artists are put in the full context of a diverse canon. So the collection is four generations of artists beginning in 1945. The work is primarily abstractions done by artists of African descent, primarily painting. And so against that backdrop, you might wonder why the first slide this lady has up is Pablo Picasso. He's a Spanish guy. Well, this really depicts the beginning of my journey as an art collector, which began with my parents when I was probably around seven or eight years old. They thought that a knowledge of culture was a mission critical exercise, and so I became the poster child for early childhood art education. They immersed me in every aspect of culture. But weekly I had ballet and music lessons across the street from the Art Institute of Chicago. And between those lessons, I would go visit a few paintings, including this one, that, was, that were my absolute favorites. But I think it's fair to say that my favorite painting as a young child was this Seurat. It, this art had the effect of transporting me to a place that I otherwise could not go. It sparked my imagination and filled me with wonderment. However, what I didn't see with my eight-year-old self in this painting or in the many paintings in museums around the country was my eight-year-old self. There was nobody on the walls that looked like me. And we all want to see ourselves in the culture. Fast forward to when I was at Harvard Business School. I met this wonderful pioneering curator by the name of Lowry Sims. And Lowry shared with me that she thought it was important that I collect art, that when I went off to Wall Street, hopefully I'd have some success, that it was important to rem remember that. And as I took the journey of collecting, it, it was really important to sort of 
you know, get a posse around me, a group of coaches and experts who could help educate me and guide me through my collective journey. Fast forward here again, Richard Mayhew was the first artist I got to know personally. And in addition to being mesmerized by the work and fascinated by Richard's personal stories, Richard gave me a gateway into what it was like to live a life of being a creative. He told me stories about the Spiral Collective, which was a group of artists, African-American artists, who would meet in Romare Bearden's studio beginning in about 1960. And they would make art together, but also discuss what it meant to be an artist of color at the dawn of the Civil Rights Movement. Many of these artists worked in the mode of abstraction, and it became clear from the stories that the vast majority of them were mightily overlooked. And so my question was, how could that happen to artists of such skill making work of such quality? The answer formed the foundation of the journey that we continue on to, to this day, which is they did not conform to expectations on any level. The traditional art world expected African-American artists to be producing identifiably African-American material, primarily, primarily figuration. The African-American community <coughs> was interested in shedding years of stereotypes, so they expected their artists to do the same thing. And so these mostly guys had no reinforcement from the outside world and really got all their sustenance from themselves. For example, if you were in my living room, you would see what my husband and I refer to as the Adam and Eve of our collection. You see Norman Lewis and Alma Thomas here, picture. Norman, for example, had all of the early markers of success. In the 1940s, he was represented by the prestigious Willard Gallery in New York. In 1956, he exhibited this painting alongside Jacob Lawrence and other American artists in the U.S. Pavilion uh, in the 1956 Venice Biennale. Lawrence and Lewis become the first African Americans to achieve that status. Norman is literally at the table, and this is a fairly well-known photograph, uh, at the Cedar Tavern in New York City, which was ground zero for the abstract expressionist movement. So Norman is literally part of the conversation of creating the narrative around abstract expressionism. But in this fairly typical depiction of the art historical canon, you see Norman as depicted as a tiny little leaf about to fall to the ground with the acorns and become forgotten. This is what brings us to writing the book that we are just in the process of just publishing at this point in time. When we started collecting, we did not really collect to a theme of intergenerationality. But we believe that one reason the Lewis legacy, legacy survived was because he had great influence on particularly the African American painters who came after him. This painting by Jack Whitten is actually one of a series entitled the Norman Lewis Triptychs. They were created after Norman died in 1979. Um, and Jack says in our book that if not for Norman Lewis, he would not have had a career as a painter. This Sam Gilliam painting was recently acquired by the, by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It was created in 1970. And the calligraphic mark making is also an homage to Norman. Now this second generation, which includes Witten and Gilliam and others, took the notion of innovation to another level. However, they also were up against obstacles with respect to getting their due recognition. So on the left, you see a shaped canvas 
made in 1957 by Ed Clark. According to James Rondo, who is the director of the Art Institute of Chicago, this is the first known shape painting. However, we all commonly believe that Frank Stella was the master of this technique, which he didn't really begin making work in this, in this vein until nearly a decade later. Similarly, you see a Jack Witten painting juxtaposed on a Gerhardt Richter painting. Witten in the early 1970s begins scraping paint across the canvas. He begins raking paint with rakes and squeegees and even afro combs. <laughs> but we think of Richter as being an innovator in this area based on his very famous 1980s paintings. This Gilliam drape further underscores how our second generation of artists were key to critical art movements. Sam, in beginning in the late 1960s and 1970s, Sam redefines painting by taking paintings off of the canvas. In the, early, in the late 1960s, Charles Gaines develops a digital aesthetic, and he does this using intricate systems combining math and technology with art. And he does, and in so doing, he really formulates some of the DNA of the conceptual movement. Now, we all customarily think of history in general, and art history in particular, as being up and to the right. But this history for African American artists and artists of the diaspora is not necessarily chronological. So we are very familiar with a certain group of very visible artists working mid-career today. Their names are Mark Bradford, Glenn Ligon, Julie Maritou, Kara Walker, Lorna Simpson, and there are others. And so the good news in the art world is that the success of that group of artists has caused the art world to look backward and reevaluate earlier careers. But there's no lack of dialogue between our second and third generations either. You see a Bradford painting made in 2014 in conversation with a Witten painting made in the, in the late 1970s. And also in, their, in our book, they sat in my living room and talked about how one influences the other. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we think this is a global story. So from about six years ago, we started diversifying our collecting strategy to include a global narrative. And we found some really compelling stories right here in South Africa. I'm just going to quickly share with you a few of my favorites. So this is Xander Blum, Nicholas Schlobo, Michelle Longa, lots, lots of examples, Serge Alinga Tugeka, Robin Rhoda, Mikhail Sabatsky, and Kamon Wallahuliri. Now, there are, it's very encouraging that there are so many green shoots in the art world today. We were really fortunate and pleasantly surprised to find that some of the best and brightest minds working in the art world, they were willing to come with us on this journey of creating this book. Now, to put it in context, some of the artists who came to the fore in the 1960s and 70s protested many of the institutions who collaborated with us and them to make this book a reality. So the people who were the protesters are now being exhibited and fed it today. But one thing we know about the history of the African diaspora is that it is tenuous and requires diligence. This is where I would invite all of you to come with us on our journey. You don't necessarily need to pursue it 
in the way that we have pursued it, find untold stories, underrepresented narratives, and tell those stories. They can be stories of women, of gay people, of regional artists. Use your curatorial skill, your artistic skill, your philanthropy, and your stewardship to tell these stories. Our global culture will be richer as a result, and we think that's an effort worth pursuing. Thank you very much. For G Innovation Center has made it possible for us to host the speakers and uh, put them through all the necessary training that they, 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 they needed. The volunteers of Telex Johannesburg, Kelo Kubu, Itatemu Koro, Namori Pare, Roshma Mabolu, Gustav Ndruli, Mbumi Shabalala, Katuchelo, Babela, Mun Mukoro. Thank you very much. With that, that's the end of the show. Drinks and conversation at FNB Joburg Art Fair. Thank you very much for being part of this. Until perhaps another time, maybe later on in November, perhaps next year again, we'll see. Thank you. Very much.
Thank <laughs> you.